December 7th, 2015 <coughs> meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Aaron, could you please call the roll? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. And Mr. Wood? Here. Thank you. Next item is the approval of minutes from the from the November 16th, 2015 meeting. I was not present at the meeting, but I'd entertain a motion. <coughs> motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Or any discussion? All in favor? Should that to be unanimous? I did abstain. Thank you. Two, two abstentions. Two abstentions. Thank you. The, uh, can I just say, I noticed I wasn't mentioned in here at all. I feel kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll attest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 no here. discussion. <laughs> she only records significant. Just try to be more more quotable this time. <laughs> Item number four: Town of Scarborough Public Works Department requests an advisory opinion for a proposed fueling station project at 20 Washington Avenue, Assessor's Map R62, Lot 9. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, as you just noted in the. In reading the the, app, the item, uh, this is an advisory opinion before the board. When there's a municipal project or site plan review ordinance requires that the department or council come before this board to receive comments in light of our site plan review um, ordinance. And so in that regard, the Public Works Department is looking to relocate the existing fueling station that is on Mason, Mason Libin, Libby Road over to their headquarters at 20... <coughs> Washington Avenue. Um, it is in the industrial district. And with that, I would turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jay. And with that, I'll uh, welcome the applicant or their representative. Is this on? You can hear me. Yes. I'm Dave Sinas with Warden and Curran, uh, engineer um, designing the uh, relocated fueling station for the town. Uh, over here on my left, I've got a location map just to give perspective on what we're talking about. So at the top of the map, you've got Route 1, Vegas Parkway, uh, Lincoln Avenue. Here's uh, Tim Hortons. Um, the current fueling facility is at, uh, at the bus yard, um, Manson Libby Road. You can see it right here, the stack of buses. It's a canopy with pumps below it. It's got an underground uh, below-grade diesel storage and gasoline storage tank. Um, it's reaching its design life. Basically, at 30 years, the DEP requires that um, these tanks be removed and uh, either reinstalled with new or you could also do above-ground storage tanks. Um, and that's what the town's looking to do, is actually consolidate this operation down to the DPW facility, which is down here on Washington Avenue. Um, currently, there's a propane fueling station behind the DPW facility. Uh, the interest in the original site plans for the DPW facility was to have a fueling station up in front here, and that's what we're looking to do, uh, consolidate those different, um, those different fuels. So have a, have a pump for um, the propane <coughs> fueling um, for some of the vehicles that the town has. Uh, that's an existing pump-mounted skid that would be moved up in front under a canopy. And then really a new uh, pump system for both diesel and gasoline with uh, two 10,000 gallon tanks, uh, 10,000 gallon tank for gasoline, 10,000 gallon tank for uh, diesel fuel, both above ground because that's easier to monitor and uh, maintain over the lifetime of those tanks. Um, so um, I'm gonna flip this around, <coughs> might be a little easier to see. Hopefully you can make this out, but I know you guys have some site plans in your packet. So uh, here's Washington Avenue. Here is the DPW building. Um, on the entrance for the fleet vehicles, uh, we're looking to put in the fueling station here. Um, so basically the expanded area that you see here, this, this expansion of pavement is for maneuvering. Um, here are two above ground storage tanks, 10,000 gallons each. They'd be right alongside uh, the ends of the Quonset Hut buildings that are on the site. And then the propane um, 
fueling facility would be up here. Uh, we, of course, have to accommodate the vehicle maneuvering capabilities for the town's uh, fire vehicle fleet, um, the plow trucks, uh, school buses, um, any other larger vehicles, along with the smaller regular vehicle, passenger vehicle sizes. Um, the requirements that the town has for they were written around commercial fueling facilities, but in looking in context to it here, we feel that they're applicable here too. Uh, have at least 15 feet of green space out in front of the facility. In this case, we've got a 50 foot yard setback um, that we maintain uh, right up in front here. Um, and then provide stormwater and spill containment management. Um, <coughs> from a stormwater perspective, uh, we do need to comply also with DEP requirements because this is what is considered a site location of development facility. It was permitted as a site law area, the whole um, complex of Washington Avenue back in the 90s. So we've submitted an application to DEP for review. We need to meet the most recent DEP requirements <coughs> for stormwater quality treatment. Um, and to do that, we've, we've proposed a underdrain soil filter here to treat the approximately, uh, let's see, 4,600 or so square feet of new impervious area. So it's not a lot of new impervious area, but we certainly are going to treat all of that and then some with the underdrain soil filter. Um, other con components of spill containment and modern fueling uh, facilities are largely dictated by uh, state and federal requirements. Um, system has an overfill alarm and overspill containers for when uh, the tanks are loaded. Um, all the tanks and piping between from the tanks to the pumps are double wall and those double wall tanks and piping are monitored for leak detection along with pressure loss sensors. So it's a fully automated monitored system. Um, and what I mean by that is the tanks themselves, the fuel is housed within it. There's a secondary wall and containment there's sensors between that that can tell whether there's a vapor leak or gasoline leak in that annular space, and it can be um, addressed through the remote uh, sensing equipment. Um, in the area of the of the tanks, the tanks will reside on a cur on a curbed pad, so when they are filled, um, the the person filling the tanks will actually close a valve. Uh, fill the tanks. If no, nothing spills, they'll open the valve lamp to allow stormwater to you know flow across that area without getting captured in it. If there was a spill, there's a sump that could then be addressed. Uh, that's a, a secondary, um, not required piece of um, additional protection that we're providing, but something that we think is important. Um, and then lastly, there's a catch basin down on this area. It's an existing catch basin. Um, we're proposing to put in an insert in that storm sentinel um, insert that does absorb some of the hydrocarbons and grease that could potentially make it to the ground, but that would be largely outside of any spill um, area. Um, we just see that as a secondary measure. Um, on the site, there's no, in this area, there's no jurisdictional wetlands that require any type of core or DP review. There's a the drainage channel along here that was permitted as a drainage feature, and, and we um, are not touching that at all, but it also is not jurisdictional. Uh, like I said, we do have to go through a site law minor modification or minor revision through DEP. That's been an active uh, um, item. We submitted our application in early November, and they're reviewing it, and we haven't seen any type of uh, comments to date, but I understand they just have a couple of questions to um, clarify a couple notes on our stormwater um, piece. Uh, we'll also need a state fire marshal office permit, main fuel board permit, main emergency management agency registration, uh, a main DEP underground regulation for the piping because our piping will go from the above ground tanks to the pumps. Um, we're required to register that. And then a notice of intent to remove the existing underground fuel tanks. Those underground fuel tanks over at the bus depot have been monitored through groundwater monitoring wells over the years, and there's been no hits of any type of contamination. So we don't anticipate that there's any active fuel in the ground there. Um, those are relatively new tanks for underground storage tank standards, and the, con the continuous annual, an annual monitoring has shown that they're likely clean, but we'll be out there monitoring that when that work takes place. And then um, the town's MS4 municipal separated storm sewer system, um, that's a permit through the DEP. It's required that your industrial facilities, your 
uh, public works facilities have a spill prevention control and countermeasures plan and um, stormwater pollution prevention plan uh, those would be updated as part of this to make sure that they <coughs> reflect this uh, this addition so um, one item that uh, was noted in in the town's review is that we should have some landscape screening some buffering um, from the sight lines of Washington Avenue and, and we definitely agree with that comment um, as you come around the corner here what we've proposed in green here are a set of uh, and that's um, five trees over here two flowering crab apples in the middle um, three fir trees and a couple fir trees on the side really to catch your view and uh, to be more of the visual um, <coughs> than the canopies behind it um, they won't fully screen out all of the fueling facility but um, they provide some level of uh, landscaping up in front um, and then as far as the fences that go around both the propane tank and then again the um, above ground storage tanks those will be black vinyl coated so they'll meet the the town standards with regards to that and lastly um, with regards to how the fuel is dispensed and how the town manages it they currently have what they call a fuel master proprietary fuel management system it allows the town to track all their fleet their sensors on their um, on their um, tanks basically to when somebody pulls up with a town vehicle the sensors in place the pump recognizes that sensor can tell how many miles that vehicle is driven can tell how much fuel is dispensed it's been a very good system for the town since they put it in a couple of years ago and uh, they'll be maintained at this location so it's uh, um, the technology is uh, quite advanced and the town taking um, is using that for the benefit of making sure that their fleet is um, is operating efficiently and that they're able to track the fuel usage and um, and we'll continue to to utilize that so glad to answer any questions that folks have and Mike Shaw from Public Works is here too and I'm sure he can <coughs> ask questions that I might not um, know the answers to relative to operations thank you uh, before we go to board discussion we do have the opportunity for any public comments so if anyone's interested please come on up and introduce yourself all right seeing none we'll go to the board does anyone have any questions or comments on this Mike thanks Corey um, so the the current fueling station is to be moved here does that mean all the buses will utilize this facility to fuel up that's correct yeah the buses will utilize this facility and currently all the town vehicles utilize the current facility where the buses park is that correct that's correct yeah. so so uh, it's going to be more of a trip for one entity and less for another I guess right yeah is there a uh, is there a preferred plan for ingress and egress for you know the buses per se I mean is that is that kind of something that's written down in a in a routine of sorts or does the traffic come from any direction um, it's a good question there's no plan written but we certainly can work to develop one because we've gone through the exercise of mapping out their turn radiuses the buses are able to come in on this entrance and loop around come to the pump and then back out and either back to their yard or if they were coming in this way uh, you know back out to um, Lincoln Avenue so at the end of the day everybody who utilizes this facility will know what the procedure is going to be so you don't have any kind of conflicts um, you know it, it, I'm sure that there'll be some upfront logistics that are set for how people are supposed to utilize it I would assume that there'll be some type of meeting and discussions with within the departments to give some advice on how vehicles should be maneuvering in but um, we know physically that it works it's just a matter of making memorializing that um, how, how the how the Public Works Department wants to see people utilize that for different vehicles and uh, I'm, I'm curious what why why uh, it, it appears to me it seems to me anyway that above ground tank is better than a below ground tank in this kind of application but why why are we doing above ground versus below ground um, largely just because of the annual inspection and maintenance of mm -hmm. the below ground tanks they have to monitor groundwater wells annually and report to DEP and in this case they've got their level sensors and such and um, they still have to be registered and they still have to give them the thumbs up that everything's in order but it's just one level of effort that they don't have to go through right okay and um, is there any kind of thought as to I mean will will the fuel needs I mean I imagine this will be from talking to Mike on the way in 
Are these tanks, above ground tanks, also have a life of approximately 30 years? Um, I'm not sure what the life is on them. I would anticipate that it's at least that much, but um, unlike the underground tanks, they could, you know, be allowed to go to a longer lifespan. So, <clears throat> 30 years can be a long time. I mean, technology can change. We might have different needs for what kind of fuels we, you know, might want over another. You have two above ground tanks, one's gasoline, one's diesel. And maybe this is a question for Mike, I don't know, but do you have plans to where you can expand or <clears throat> you can change the distribution of what fuel you use over another over the course of, say, 10, 15 years from now, if your needs change? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, we, we've seen that already in the last five years. Um, Dave mentioned that there's a propane fueling station here. Currently, we have four school buses and about another four public works vehicles that run on uh, on, on propane. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a it's a it's a skid mounted palletized unit. Um, we'll, we'll be having more vehicles that'll be coming in on that. I mean, we're not we're not going to get away from gasoline and diesel completely for for certainly a foreseeable future, but right. there is, you know, there, there are other ways that we can uh, we can address uh, different different fuels and, and that sort of thing. As you know, using the, the propane as an example, um, I would assume that if there are other alternative fuel sources that come down the road, um, they'll have uh, a unitized way of at least starting the starting the fueling process and that sort of thing. So in your view, this facility, uh, it, we're not maxed out on this site, but in your, in, in your view, this facility can be flexible enough where it can expand or change over to whatever needs might be dictated. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, even the, uh, we, we can assume that it'll be some sort of liquid fuel that we would run. Uh, I mean, even if uh, it gets to a point where uh, we go to, we, we, can, we can clean down one of those tanks and put a different type of fuel in it or something like that if, mm -hmm. if something else comes down the pike. So. Okay. I think there's some flexibility there. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else on this side? Ron? Over here? Susan? Could you flip it around for me again? Sure. I just want to, <coughs> excuse me, after your um, presentation about the landscaping, now I want to, somebody had to say landscaping, I'm sorry. Um, Okay, where it says existing propane tank, behind that is a, looks like in my little picture, it looks like a um, parking lot. What is that the present, uh, so the existing propane down underneath there? Correct, yeah, the existing propane's in the far corner of, of the facility and it will be moved up to here along with um, putting in the new tanks up near the entrance. Right so what's in here? Oh, I don't know. Okay, so what is actually underneath where it says existing propane tank? If you could tear that sign off from there, there's oh. a the driveway that comes from this this the site space. down. Oh, sorry? it's he said it's a lay down yard for aggregates for different. Okay, um, I just wanted to make sure that products. it was part of this lot because it didn't seem to fit. Okay, and um, if I'm going to come in because I want to do business there. I've only been down there once. It's the little driveway right after the E, correct? Yep. This is so the, now show me where the, where the landscaping is going. The landscaping is up here. Um, so the, the fueling station's over here, the landscaping here. This is the um, town vehicle mm -hmm. entrance. Mm -hmm. Over here, this would be employees and visitors, and that'll be maintained. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be fine just to make a mention that when the final plan comes to us, we're going to have to have a little landscaping. Um, this is it? This, 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 oh, that's is, this, is, this is your this advisory is, opinion. This is, this is, this is, is, is it. Make sure you this is the have a landscaping plan. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do, but... Yeah. We'll make sure that it's those green dots there. I know, those little green dots. Just yeah. make sure they're there. <laughs> okay. I'm happy. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I do have a question, uh, just probably better for Mike. Uh, right now you have a place down there where citizens can go down there and pick up sand and things like that. Isn't that going to be right where this is? So we're, this is a selfish question. <laughs> <laughs> You'll still be able to get your sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually one of the things we do have, um, 
right here currently is uh, there'll be a sand. The, there is the the public sand pile, which is it's kind of up towards the top more, and then also uh, an overflow trash that we've got to move as well. And I guess it's something that we haven't really laid out completely yet, Dave. Um, you know, but it, it's it's going to be. It'll, it'll still be in that area, and I think we'll try and work it in on that same side in one place. It doesn't take up that much space, but it'll still be there. And, you know, it'll be up, in the, it'll be up closer to Washington Avenue because the whole idea behind putting those there to begin with was that we don't want traffic going into uh, the working area of behind the building and that sort of thing, which is also why the fuel island is up there, too. So it'll have to okay. be up in that area. Anything else? Okay. No. Nick? Uh, dumpster. I see that you have an area that you're going to move the dumpster. Where's the dumpster going? And yeah, there was um, what Mike had just mentioned. We, part of part of the part, part sand of the, and salt, okay, and then the also the also, trash. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we haven't identified that area, but somewhere over on this side. It would be on that side still. So you wouldn't think about moving it to where your existing propane <coughs> tank is towards the back. That wouldn't be a good spot. No, again, if if we were to do that, then the general public would have to basically go through the whole operation, and and uh, there's a lot of vehicle movement in that backyard because that's where all the vehicle maintenance for the whole town, including the school department, goes on, and also there's a lot of pedestrian activity out there with workers and so forth. So, trying to keep trying to keep the uh, that in and out traffic to a minimum in that back area is is, is important. If it, uh, yeah, if it ends up towards roadside, you have full intentions of fencing and landscaping, I assume. Yes, it's 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 it's, it's enclosed fencing right now. But if we if we were to do anything that was that would have, we would need additional landscaping. We would certainly do that. But it was it will be behind the 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 depicted landscaping that's there right now. Okay. In some fashion. Thank you. Roger, did you have something just, else? Just curious. Um, on the school buses right now, do they fuel up every day? Do they have to get? So you're going to have a whole stream of school yeah the buses. fuel the, the fuel buses uh, the, the school buses fuel up every day okay. uh, all the police vehicles fuel up after every shift and emergency vehicles for the most part fuel up after every response so um, th there's a fair amount of activity in there but again because it's not that deeply into the project um, it, it'll be fine and, and, and as Dave mentioned. Everything that we have fits the turning radius, and we'll be able to maneuver in there. They won't have to go down into the uh, into the backyard and turn around. Um, so it's it'll 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 be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All set. Yeah. Anyone else? So I think I'm hearing support for this. Um, I don't really have any other questions that haven't already been asked and addressed. You're clearly cognizant of traffic circulation and landscaping needs and um, <coughs> got to <coughs> get everything out for the public sand pile in the dumpster, which we trust you will. Um, and this, to uh, Mr. Wood's questions, uh, sounds like it's sort of a long-term, long-range solution and something that'll be scalable and adjustable going forward. So um, I think we collectively are giving a positive opinion here. And uh, unless anyone has anything else, Mike? I, I would only uh, <clears throat> just reiterate that I think the need um, to come up with some sort of tra uh, traffic flow plan, you know, to be distributed to all the users so that everybody is right. singing from the same sheet of music, that's all. Yeah, I agree. Right. All right, it's, it's been interesting for me to hear just how active that is down there. I didn't active, fully yeah. appreciate how much, how much traffic, or not traffic, but how much activity there is down there. So... Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on. Item number five, Nonsuch River Brewing requests sketch plan review for a proposed restaurant at 201 Gorham Road, assessor's map R55, lot 34. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is a sketch plan uh, for the development of a proposed uh, restaurant and brewery in the TVC3 uh, uh, property that is located on Gorham Road. Um, as the board will note, sketch plan is really designed as an opportunity for the board to 
understand the general parameters of the development um, for the applicant to ask design questions moving forward as they move in preparation of a formal application and for the board to provide guidance um, in those regards. You'll have received staff comments on this item uh, where we flagged a, a couple of zoning parameter <coughs> questions that need to be addressed as this moves forward. Um, and we also identified um, that, um, as some board members are well aware, the town is currently in the preliminary design stage of uh, looking at the Gorham Road, the stretch of the Gorham Road corridor from Payne Road to Oak Hill, and looking at uh, future coordination with the infrastructure uh, elements, particularly sidewalks that uh, may occur with that. And again, that's something we would look to coordinate with the applicant on as this item moves along in the process. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Allen. Great, thank you. Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions, uh, joined tonight by Mike Richmond, Chris Bacala from Custom Concepts, um, and the owners uh, slash developers, Tim Boardman, Mike Schuler, and their other partner, Jeff Gambardella, is not here at the moment. Um, as Jay mentioned, this is a 2.2 acre site. It's located on Gorham Road. It's, uh, if you're going north on Gorham Road, it's right before you get to the Eight Corners area, right before Spring Street uh, heads off to the east. Uh, we are located in the TVC3 zone. We are the last property in the TVC3 zone. The property <coughs> just to our south is um, in the residential zone. Um, being that there's a zone district divide right there, we need to respect a 25 foot setback. That's not shown currently on our plan, but will be on our next iteration. We're proposing a roughly 5,200 square foot footprint, or that's the footprint of the roof. The actual building is, is smaller than that. Um, similar to the Asian Fusion restaurant that we worked on, there's, there's two separate occupants in this building. There is the brewery occupant, occupant and the restaurant occupant. So those will both be below the 5,000 square foot threshold that is required by the zoning. Um, we're proposing off-street parking. Um, that off-street parking is, is greater than what is required based on the square footage of the building, but is more in lines with what the developers believe is necessary to operate the, the restaurant. Um, we think it's going to be successful and, and very busy, and we think we're going to need um, the 50-plus parking spots that we're showing. The site has its challenges. It's bisected by a stream. Um, the magenta line shown on the plan is the 25-foot setback off of that stream, and the, the orange line is a 75-foot setback. So in that area, any work needs to be permitted through the DEP. Um, inside of 25 feet is, is kind of a no-touch zone, a, a buffer that you know we don't go there unless we really, really have to. So you'll notice that our parking is, is shoved so that it's actually in front of the building. Um, that's because we just kind of ran out of room. And that's something that we're working on with staff to resolve. Um, there's definitely <coughs> language in the zoning and an off-street parking ordinance that speaks to that. Um, it's something we're aware of and, and something we are working on and, and hope to have resolved in the in next week or so. Um, as far as stormwater goes, uh, we've met with staff, we've met with uh, Angela, and we've talked about uh, some ideas on how to um, treat stormwater. I, I think one of the, the leading options right now is to use a pervious pavement with storage underneath that and look at infiltration. Um, that's a, it's an LID technique. It's, it's one that's been used somewhat in the Northeast, but not, has not been widely used. Uh, we think with the fill that we're going to bring into the site, this may be an opportune area to uh, to use this. I know it was used down at the Starbucks and, and Bitterford Savings Bank, so um, it's something that we're looking into and, and we're working on a design for that right now. Other than that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. He's going to talk a little bit about the building architecture, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm Chris Bacala. Um, as you can see from the elevations, we're going with a, a post and beam construction, roughly a, a, the a pole barn motif for the for the building, with a stone clad uh, foundation, uh, clabbered siding, painted or stained, uh, and with a standing seam metal roof. Uh, so we added some cupolas on top, and we're extending the roof up. 
toward the front, the our front entrance to create a, a mezzanine um, balcony and then an entrance below. Um, So in plan, and the lower plan is the first floor plan. You'll see the um, separation between the brewery on the right uh, with the dining uh, in the center, uh, kitchen and open bar, and entrance to the right or to the left. Uh, we're going to have a, a partition allowing views down into the brewery from the seating area. Uh, and then a stair up, up, up to the mezzanine area for a, a function lounge space, uh, which will open to uh, a balcony above. Okay, thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll hold our questions until you're mm -hmm. done with your full we're presentation. We're all set. If you have any questions, we're, we're happy okay. to take care of them. All right. Thank you. Susan, you look... Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused about the um, elevation. The um, As I'm looking at the elevations, the upper left-hand side, and what I wrote down was mezzanine balcony. Outside? Yes. So it's underneath. On. Yeah, it's on. So, check it. um, so this <coughs> portion is the, the roof overhang, so you have uh, balcony okay. above, and that's this area right above. Okay, so there'll be dining out there. Yes. And beer. <coughs> <out there. laughs> we, we assume. <laughs> um, in the winter, it will, there will be nobody out there. Okay. That explains it a little. While we're still talking about elevations, this is one of those times when my inadequacies really annoy me. I absolutely know how big that building, no idea how big that building is. I can't look at that and have a clue how big it is. It looks to me like it's a mammoth building, but I don't believe it. So when you bring the next elevations in, will you do it so that it looks and put it in context? Okay, show me what is beside it, show me, you know, give me some concept. By itself, that's the biggest honking barn I've ever seen. But I know that's not what you're looking for, so you need to give me some better way of knowing just how that's going to fit on the lot, how it's going to look to the person next door, how it's going to look to me as I drive by. Okay? I don't disapprove of the building at all. Um, if we're going to move the parking to the front, which I understand, now we can have that. Yeah. <coughs> I understand your lot issues, but let me tell you, I am so glad you're coming to Scarborough, and I'm so glad of where it is you're going, <laughs> yay, that I'm going to really try to welcome through some of our issues here. Okay, parking for me is a biggie. I think that they're going to have a real problem with the entrance where it is on this drawing. <laughs> I drive this at least three times a day, you know, well, four times, over and back and over and back. And I, I know that corner really well. That whole thing is you're coming up from the river, heading towards the intersection, okay? Lots of people are going to be flocking here because we're so excited that you're in town. And that stretch of the road isn't going to handle an awful lot of stopping and turning traffic. So the further you can get that entrance to the west, North, thank you. The better, like, you know, switch it and put the entrance on the other side and the, go ahead, okay. you, wanna, you wanna answer it, go ahead. Yeah, so there's a couple things that are going on here. One, uh, we're aware that there's improvements planned for this stretch of road, and we we're believe and we hope that there's plenty of right of way with that some of this widening can occur with some of the left turn lane down the middle to allow for turning into our site. That being said, this, this entrance doesn't work right now because of the 25-foot setback we have to respect the zoning. We're actually proposing to move it very up. Oh, here. that's great. Well, never mind. <laughs> I shouldn't have gone on so long. That's just what I'm looking for. That doesn't, however, affect the fact that you want the parking itself closer than usual, and that just makes <coughs> me want to say make sure the landscaping is good, not so that it interferes with the, tr the, the, in the entrance and egress and so on, but... Correct. Now, there's some other things that we can do with the parking, too, to get this in a better situation. Right now, we're going with the town standard 25 foot aisles. We don't really need 25 feet aisles. It's nice if we can get it. Um, we're, we're probably talking maybe to reduce this to 22 feet here 
22 feet there, that gains us six feet that we can slide this back. Okay. So we're working on trying to get that the best that we okay. can, along with the changes that uh, staff and I need to <coughs> work through with, with regards to that. Including snow, uh, snow storage, removal, whatever, because of all of your constraints, the need for the large parking, and so close to the wetlands, and how is that going to be dealt with? I'm not asking you to answer yeah. it, but that's a, that's a biggie for me. And um, what was the other one? I took landscaping, right? Yeah. Of course I did. Okay, so show me where the, the first dotted line to the uh, above the parking. But that one right there. That's your 25. Correct. And the property goes all the way to the other side of the river. Yeah. 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 There's actually an upland area over here on the other side. Of the street. What are we going to do with that land? At the moment, we plan to do nothing. Leave it wooded. Leave it wooded. I'm thinking in terms of the future use of the property, you know, I mean, if there's anything that needs to be, have access to it, is there a way to get to it through the wetlands to get to the upland? If we chose to, yeah, we could, we could and apply the, for a permit to get across the stream to get over there. But the land itself is not going to be, be resellable to somebody else to go in there and do something with it. Not that I can. We don't need any um, right away or anything granted. Okay. Oh, and thank you for even considering infiltration parking. There are goddesses in heaven for people who do that. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to see more, seeing you again. Roger? Um, I really don't have any questions. I think Sue asked <coughs> some good questions there. Um, you can't use the existing structure there at all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we have three other schemes, that, <laughs> but we're just not going to bring them in. <laughs> Roger loves to catch you laughing. Uh, <coughs> no, but I, um, I, I had, I was thinking about the the entrance way too, where you're going to move it. So, uh, I think it's, it looks terrific, and I think it's kind of exciting. So, I don't have anything further. Thanks, Nick. Uh, if you can just go to the. Um, the future proposed entrance. Oh, is that, is that going to be where your current handicap spot is? is? Is that right? Right towards the front corner of that building? Yeah. Is we'll, that where you're looking? Yeah. What we're going to do is move it over here with the other ones, so that we all group together. So how is yeah? So how is traffic flow going to go? It's you'll so just have be, a straight shot be these across the face. Be eliminated, so yeah, it'll be a straight shot. Yeah. Do you have any concerns about pedestrian crossing, cars coming in off of a fast turn to? Get past traffic and. I'm looking at that distance, we've got probably 40 or 50 feet. Okay, so it's, it's an extensive amount of distance. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, that was it. I just wanted that clarified. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Ron? Yeah, I got a few questions. <coughs> I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with Michael Brewery's day, so <laughs> top of the list is. Explain. Uh, I won't explain. Uh, that water and sewage because I've been involved in personally with some microbreweries, and um, that's the top of the list of problems for facilities of that. Has that been looked into? It has. We've actually already met with uh, the sanitary district. We had a good meeting with them. Um, we've actually talked about some methods of pretreatment uh, before we discharge our waste. There will be a sewer inspection manhole for the uh, sanitary district to inspect the waste reports. <coughs> Yeah, I think we've talked to him. We have a pretty good idea of what he's looking for. Okay, and, and the flow of water also and the amount and so forth and so on. Yeah, we've got Portland water. I think it's a 12-inch main right out right in front of us. And the second, and I, it was alluded to, and I'm going to follow up, is I'm dealing on a subcommittee about traffic flow on Gorham Road. And, you know, I don't have an answer here, and I don't pretend to, but... Uh, it's certainly an issue as far as what's happening in and, and that vicinity, <coughs> uh, especially with the growth of the Scarborough Gallery and so forth and so on. Um, <coughs> have you thought about that and the flow of, of traffic? We have, and uh, Bill Bray is our traffic engineer. Um, he's going to be looking at that. He's working on the traffic study right now. I'll be interested to see how the in and out as we go along, by the way, to be honest with you, Lee. Um, and uh, <clears throat> let me go on record as saying I'm glad to see that area 
developed. It's, it's just one of my sore spots. So we've gotten a few, a rid of a few. That's another one. Um, comments from staff, I'm sure you've seen. Uh, 5,000 versus 5,200. Have you addressed that? Yeah, that's what we we're saying. That, that that's You're allowed 5,000 square feet per unit of occupancy. We have two occupants in the building, so they'll both be under 5,000 square feet. Okay, so that's for either one. Is that if, Am I to understand that? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I didn't... Um, I'll also be curious as uh, stated about parking and, and flow of traffic in the facilities as, as without, as without uh, the facilities. Uh, buffering, that's a, another issue that... Yeah, we're going to have a landscape architect on board and work with us to make sure we're, we're buffering both sides actually of the building and, and uh, screening for the parking. Okay, and of course the need to meet with our town engineer in going forward with this. Yeah, we actually met on Friday. Okay, all right. Um, and sidewalks, as you know, as we've been developing various facilities, uh, we've been pushing the sidewalk issue. <clears throat> and I don't know if that's come up with your discussions with staff or not. It has, uh, my understanding is that sidewalks are part of the 114 road improvements that when they happen will, will be there. And then the question becomes where the sidewalk's going to be. and I, Hope that we'll have an answer to that uh, by the time we submit this for or get done the site plan approval process. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Anything? What's that? Mike? Thank you. Well, going last, I don't have much to add. Um, <clears throat> what, what, uh, what, if any, relaxation from the TV zone are you looking for? Did you mention anything? Yeah, that's something that uh, actually Jay and I have been talking about. I'm not 100% sure of how it's going to work, but we've been talking about it. The, the language is kind of weird on how it's written right now. I wrote it, but You push your building way back. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's something we're working on. I, I can put it that way. We'll, we'll have an answer soon. Okay. Um, because although that this use would be permitted in the TV zone, obviously I'm hearing um, from you and others that we have to be sensitive to the fact that it, it's surrounded by residents. Um, on one, yeah, it's surrounded by residents. One is in the TV zone, the other right. one's actually in the residential. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll be very curious as to how you're going to buffer from those residences. Um, also, sensitive to what kind of activity might be, you know, occurring on each end of that property, as far as you know, traffic and. Uh, lighting, parking lot lighting, um, outdoor speakers of any kind, you know, that that might not be uh, looked upon favorably. Because, uh, again, even though it's a TBC zone, you know, I, it, it's almost like you're kind of like the first in the neighborhood right here, in this small, very small kind of neighborhood. So we have to be sensitive to that. Um, uh, demarcating where all the pedestrian crossings, where you want people how you want to direct pedestrians in and out of the building, you know, so <clears throat> like someone, else, like my colleague mentioned, so there's no conflict with traffic. Um, low impact signage, meaning, you know, not bright and neon like and consistent with our ordinance, but then maybe <coughs> a little bit more sensitive to the fact of where you are. <coughs> um, but other than that, it's a nice looking building, no surprise there. Um, it's uh, very attractive, very handsome. And uh, I think this, this, this rendition that I have, I don't know if it's the same as the flip side of your board, but as I look at this, and I, I think I was in agreement with what uh, Sue said, this is actually opposite of what the direction that this is telling mm -hmm. me, right? I mean, they right here is the, correct. yeah, right. okay. Right. And there's going to be two tenants? Yes. Yes, one is the brewery component and the other is the restaurant. I see. And they, they are physically separated. Businesses, two separate businesses. Yes. Yeah. But obviously they're going to be complementing each other because be, yeah. one, one will be served. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to your next trip back also. I hope we've given you enough uh, to come back with more. I know we haven't heard from the chair, but, but thank you, Corey. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, and Lee, you certainly know the drill when it comes to sketch test plan, and, and you're well underway in meeting with all the right people and getting the traffic study done. Um, I'm also uh, 
encouraged by what we've seen so far in terms of the, the concept and the architecture. I'll look forward to seeing more detail on some of that. And as Ms. Agla said, um, something with, that will give us a little bit better sense of scale and context and show the buffering and maybe you know, some detail on lighting and, and signage and things like that. Um, one, one potential issue that I have is on the parking and the number of spaces. Um, and it was noted in staff comments and I sort of had a similar reaction. And I do appreciate that you're contemplating uh, the pervious surface. But that said, uh, it still strikes me as a lot of parking. Um, and I'd just um, be interested to hear, and, and I know it's still work in progress, but I'd be interested to hear what the rationale uh, is to this point uh, beyond sort of just a general sense of, of demand. Sure. I, I believe it, it's based on, and we're going to be able to prove this with part of our traffic study, we'll prove based on other similar uses. Um, the fear is that they're successful. It's jam-packed full of cars and there's no place to park and, you know, potential clients are just driving by and they're not coming in. I mean, that's the rationale behind where we are now. Now it's up to us to prove it because I mean, I've seen it happen in other locations. So it's just a matter of getting the numbers to prove that point. If you'd like to come up and introduce yourself, go, go right ahead. Thank While you. While you're doing that, Mr. Chair, that's a good point you bring up. What is the requirement for spaces based upon how many customers uh, they expect to have? Well, it's My name is Tim Boardman. I'm one of the owners of the project. And uh, the rationale behind parking, just for an example, how many of you folks carpooled here tonight? How many of you folks carpooled here tonight? <laughs> That's my point. Well, but that doesn't answer my question. Well, the minimum, the min I, I guess the seating is based on a four top, requires one parking space. But we all know that all four of those people aren't going to travel in the same vehicle. So if we meet just the minimum, we're going to have a full lot, and our restaurant's only going to be 25% full. That's all. Well, how many seats do you expect to have at the restaurant? Approximately 140. And I'll go to staff now. What's the requirement? Um, yeah, so for restaurants, off the top of my head, I think Mr. Borman um, touched on one of the requirements. It's one, um, one parking space for four, four table seats, uh, one parking space for two counter seats, bar seats. Um, there's a requirement for <laughs> one space per I think it's about 120 square feet of waiting area yeah. and then there's some addition for employees um, so it's a, yeah, it's a it, bit it, of a, a you know there's a there's a number of factors that go into it and that certainly um, we'd look for the applicant to provide sort of a matrix of how they're meeting the standard um, the minimum standard anyway okay right, thank you and I'm and I'm not thank you Jay and I'm not I'm not necessarily predisposed to say no on that number of spaces but I, that's just it's sketch plan and yep. so we'll look forward to seeing that additional analysis sure I, I a couple of instances like the sea dog restaurant in south portland that's almost impossible to get a parking space there on a friday night mm -hmm. it's and that's right. a situation we're trying to avoid and and i don't know that even with the 55 to 60 spots that we propose that mm -hmm. we <coughs> believe that'll be enough but we need to do our homework and prove to you why sure. we're, we're going to use that. And it's, I mean, it's a dilemma we see, and, and we certainly hope that that's, that, that it's exactly. highly su successful, and we don't want to put a ceiling on that artificially, um, but just want to make sure yeah. the due diligence is done. Um, uh, beyond that, um, again, we've, we've sort of just, I'll, I'll uh, let you get in again in a minute, uh, Roger. Uh, just to sort of wrap up my thoughts again, we've sort of gone through the inventory of mostly typical uh, sketch plan items and things that we'll want to see going forward. I am glad to hear that you're, you're, everyone is conscious of the, of the corridor planning that's going on and that you're, that you're anticipating that. And hopefully um, we'll be kind of finalizing the design in a way that contributes to that and kind of uh, complements that. And has also been noted by, by a couple of my fellow board members, um, and I think you acknowledge this yourself, um, it's a little bit of a unique spot in that you're sort of at a the sort of bottom edge, so to speak, of the TVC3. Right. And so there are some, I think, special considerations that go into that in terms of buffering and yeah. just a general awareness of who the neighbors are and things like that. So, um, but beyond that, um, I think it's got a lot of promise and I'll 
look forward to seeing the next the next iteration. Roger, did you have any, anything yeah, else? I was just going to uh, comment on the parking. Um, the, um, <coughs> for instance, uh, Sebago Grill. I mean, the, the parking over there, it's very, it's always very busy. It's hard to find a parking spot over there. And almost every pub you go to where there's a freestanding pub, the parking is very, you know, it's very uh, difficult to find parking spots. So one thing we don't want is we don't want people out, out on Gorham Road parking, I don't think. Mm. And that could be, so if this, to me, if the parking works, especially with the um, materials <coughs> that we use, yeah. I think that makes sense to go that route than to take a chance that it's not going to be enough parking and there's going to be an overflow out on, on the Gorham Road because I don't think we want that at all. Right, we don't want, we don't want queuing and we don't want right, people yeah. doing yeah. sort of freelance parking. <laughs> so, no, that's, that's a, definitely a valid point. <laughs> Yeah, go on. Um, <clears throat> and, and this probably goes back to the uh, one of the first questions Susan asked, which is the scaling's a little difficult right now to comprehend. But if I'm driving by this, that looks like that's going to be a really big metal roof that I'm going to be driving by. And yep. I'd want to see a little bit more architecture yep. built into that uh, for the eye, just to break that up. Because that, that's a lot of metal roof from what I can tell right now. Well, I, th I think one thing that would help, and, and again, it's, it's the, the nature of architectural drawings and elevations. It gets flattened out a bit. We have a, a 12 and 12 pitch roof. I think those cupolas will help bring the roof back. And I think a, a simple perspective, which I could provide, will show that it indeed, it, it'll show that in reality, it's not going to be that big a roof. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is there anything more you need from us? I think we're good. Okay. Great. Well, thanks. Good luck. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Yay. Go. Thank you. Go kill. Thank you. It's about some time somebody decided to get on this guy. Next item, Jason and Wendy Gloud, Sotero, and Alicia Giftos request a sketch plan review for subdivision amendment of the Foster Farm subdivision plan, assessor's map R47, lots 7 and 701. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, uh, this is a sketch plan for a subdivision that was originally approved in 1999 and then um, had its first amendment in 2004. Um, this, the, the properties in question are in the VR2 district, which um, have sort of an interesting component in their space and bulk standards, which essentially refer the zoning compliance standards or lot compliance standards to the R2 district for lots that are able to, uh, that are in subdivisions, previously approved subdivisions prior to 2006, which these lots are and that have access to uh, sewer connection. And with the recent installment of sewer along Broad Turn Road to connect to the Habitat for Humanity subdivision, just up to the uh, west of this parcel, or uh, this, uh, this area, um, these properties now do have access to the sewer. So um, they're designed in terms of an R2 um, properties. Uh, you'll receive staff comments, um, which we flag. Um, concepts or, or um, considerations of traffic management along this corridor. That's a pretty busy area in town and ways to um, try to manage that. Uh, questions in terms of any uh, DEP stormwater permitting or amendment permits that may, may or may not be necessary based on this proposal. Um, and then just also note that one of the lots, lot identifies lot 20, currently has a daycare or child care business on the site and so we just want to be sure that when when and if that lot is uh, uh, permitted to be divided that the spacing of the remaining lot that has the existing home in um, uh, child care facility has adequate provisions to accommodate that that the lot division doesn't somehow uh, encumber particularly parking that may be necessary um, so just some more detail on that <coughs> But with that, this is a sketch plan, so at this point there's no um, action anticipated by the board at this evening. Thanks, Jay. Before I hand it off to the applicant, um, just wanted to flag something that I think I'd like to have clarified right out of the gate or early on uh, regarding Lot 20. If I understand the staff memo correctly, Lot 20 has, 
a single family residence with a child care business which also is the subject of a zoning violation mm -hmm. associated with outdoor storage from a landscape or construction business is it correct that all that is happening in that one lot that is my understanding based okay. on letters in the file and okay what we've seen on site just wanted to make sure all right thanks and with that i'll hand it over to the applicant my name Thank is you. matthew eck from sebago technics i'm here representing the applicants um basically uh jason and wendy glaude own uh lot 20 and Sotero and alicia giftos own lot one as shown on the plan um, jason glaude and uh, Sotero giftos are here this evening as well if you have any questions directly for them um, but as as um jay said basically the zone change and the addition of sewer um, along broad turn road has uh, allowed these lots to be now divided so if i'm flipping it over here you can see the uh, tan lots basically will retain the existing homes and infrastructure with them and the green lots will be the uh, new lots to be developed um, lot one on this side um, does have some utilities running through uh, the area that will be developed that will be rerouted and will have um, some easements associated with them to go through um, to go along Saratoga Lane <coughs> within uh, the lot to be uh, sold we are looking at, um, at basically a, a 20,000 square foot uh, minimum for this zone we're over 20,000 square feet on each of these lots um, there is an existing buffer that's within uh, the lot on the side the area outside the buffer is tw oh, just over 20,000 square feet as well um, so we're just trying to make sure that everyone has the 20,000 that's that's being required by the town um, we uh, certainly uh, did receive the memo um, from last week uh, I forwarded it uh, via email to my clients as soon as I received it um, uh, Mr. Glaude was not aware that he needed to put um, erosion control or, or different um, things around the area that had been um, grubbed out on his lot. Uh, he immediately contacted his landscaper and had um, erosion control um, berms placed. Um, I believe it was the following day. Um, so took care of that immediately upon finding that out. Um, there is an existing daycare facility on the site and that's all retained all of the existing features within the lot um, basically the, the green area on the side is existing field um, we're not removing any parking any infrastructure any utilities from the existing use um, he does own a um, seal coating business it's not a landscaping business um, he has a, a company truck that he drives home each evening uh, it's not uh, a storage facility for a landscaping he was having landscaping done on the site um, but he's not a landscaper by trade so i believe that's all being addressed with um, brian longstaff um, and being taken care of and um, as far as um, the driveway situation um, certainly the the lot here that abuts saratoga lane we have no problem um, restricting that to have the driveway access off Saratoga Lane um, the other lot um, basically this is the original farmhouse on 65 its driveways access 65 for several decades and the other lot would have an extremely long driveway uh, over 250 feet to get over to Saratoga Lane um, it has well over the minimum requirement for frontage on broad turn road so we certainly would request to have the driveway access come off broad turn road for that one driveway and if there are any questions for us this evening we're certainly here to welcome them okay. thank you Ron would you like to start <coughs> off this time um, yeah recap for me what's on lot 20 right now there's a house school uh, I mean uh, childcare. Care. Yeah. And what else uh, nothing else on the lot he does own a seal coating business he parks his his company truck there each evening okay and what's the intent of the second building that they want to put on there is it a is it a private home or Re a yeah it would be for sale for a residential for anyone to come build a house okay and as staff has said what are the precautions for the daycare <laughs> that are going to be taking place once another building is put on that 
parcel. The daycare has, has been operating. All of the, the parking and driveway that are there currently are adequate for the daycare. Um, we can show uh, some additional parking um, um, statistics showing what the daycare would need, but it has been functioning as a daycare currently, and we're not removing anything <coughs> from the existing facility. It's all contained within the TAN. There is no parking. It's, it's all lawn, basically, in the green area. So that lawn area will now be a, a single-family residential house, eventually. Um. Okay, I, that's all I have right now, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ron. Mike? Okay. Um, <clears throat> originally, tell me from uh, right around, I, um, Mr. Glott is here, I guess, right? So maybe not. Yes. Wasn't Lot 20 also part of Lot 19 way back? Wasn't 19 split off 20? Which it was created that, 20. That was the last amendment done in 2004. Right. That's when actually this farmhouse was added to the subdivision. Right. It was actually excluded from that in the original subdivision. Um, now the daycare facility. That's that's an approved in-home business, is it not? It is approved licensed business. But it, it's is, is it regulated as an in-home business for staff? Um, I. Our files, we didn't have much in the way of permitting for it. Um, the only thing I was able to find in code and planning files was there was a, and I don't, I forget the year, maybe I have a copy of it here. Um, there was an expansion on the building. Uh, let's see. Jay, while you're looking anyway, at there it, was an what, what's the capacity for the top here? That's what I'm not aware of either. Uh, okay. So there's not a lot of information in our files, so I, um, I was <clears> happy <throat> to hear uh, Mr. X speak to providing a plan that would talk about showing the uh, adequate parking for the uh, yep. capacity of the daycare, and that's really what staff's comments were directed at, was really yep. trying to understand what is the capacity of that daycare and um, how that functions. My job is really <clears throat> to do the best I can to um, Evaluate, analyze, interpret the ordinances, and if this is allowed in the ordinances, then, then I'll offer you know maybe um, a suggestion here and there. Outside of that, I, I personally don't really like it too much, only because um, this this subdivision was created with certain space and bulk requirements at the time. That's changed because the sewer now is run in front of Saratoga. Um, now, was that run? Uh, for uh, Dunstan, or was it run for the um, uh, subsidized housing that's going in? It was run for the subsidized housing past this. Site. So uh, good for you. Uh, but um, you know, from a bird's eye view, I don't particularly care the way it's going to lay out because these lots will be significantly different in size and scope and um, and use, in my opinion, than than what the uh, subdivision was originally intended. But again, if it's within the ordinance, then just, I will I will say that uh, um, obviously lot 21 the only way only practical way in is the driveway off broad turn um, um, so that's unfortunate um, on lot 20 there is a lot of activity that goes on there that would suggest it's more of a commercial activity than a residential activity so I heard your words and they were carefully spoken and I listened to them, but it's really not the reality. There's a lot of storage of vehicles there. Um, if it's within the ordinance, then fine. But I think it looks like the town is looking into that. So let's make sure that Lot 20 is in compliance. Yep. Um, I think that's important before we move forward with dividing the lot. Okay, so that's my comment as it relates to Lot 20. And since, since the owner's here, I'm just kind of curious uh, why did we take down the big tree? Was it diseased or something? Or uh, I think there was a big tree in the front that had to come down. Yeah. But uh, uh, you need to come on up and introduce sorry, yourself. Sorry to make you get up, but you know, it's not really part of the submission. But I probably won't have another chance to ask. So. I'm Jason Glowed. Um, when I we we come in uh, put in a swimming pool, and um, back ten years ago when I bought the place, one of those trees lost the whole top off it. 
um, brushed right down the side of the house. The other, the other tree, the, the other big one, really towered my house, um, and it was just unsafe, you know, for me, um, unsafe, plus the leaves, plus the limbs that I'm constantly picking up. Um, I thought it would look better as grass. It always looks better for a guy like me who's just driving by. So <clears throat> I'm not criticizing it. It was just unfortunate. It was just such a big grand tree, that's all. Probably, right. Probably and I'm going to do some other landscaping <laughs> afterwards. Um, just we got late in the season to be able to get grass growing. Um, so I'm not, you know, we're not really sure what we're going to do. But we're going to plop some trees back, some mature trees back up in the front. Once we get grass and everything else growing, it's just a matter of, you know, time and whatnot. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, as far as lot 20, uh, I guess it's called lot, we can call lot one right now. <clears throat> okay. And we're going to divide lot one and create lot 23. 22. 22. 22. I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't look carefully. Lot 22. 23 is coming next year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, lot 22, you're proposing the driveway would be off Saratoga. Yes, we would put that re restriction in the deed and on the plan. And uh, it, it appears like this is there's a significant amount of frontage there, not not just to meet the ordinance, but also for safety in and out of that driveway and incorporate any stacking, folks leaving Saratoga, going into Saratoga, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's, there's certainly adequate. I mean, it, it's well over the minimum requirement of the R2 zone. And I, I would think that as you get further along in the design, the driveway, my thinking is the driveway would be more towards the, um, the north side of the lot as opposed to the south side. Yeah, and, and we're not doing any house design. <coughs> we don't know who will be purchasing that lot or right. you know, what residence will be built. We can <coughs> well, we can, we can uh, prior to approval, we can actually probably put in some sort of language okay. that would we limit. We can put a restriction that, that will certainly mm -hmm. come off. Right off of Saratoga, but not only that, but where on Saratoga? Yeah, we can certainly yeah. restrict the distance back from Broad Turn. So anyway, those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm not really excited about it, but it is it is what it is. I mean, uh, the sewer went by um, uh, Saratoga, and um, folks uh, taking advantage of that, and that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Certainly, um, it's just that you know the subdivision had a certain feel and size and scope uh, to it, and I think that this takes a lot a bit away from it. And again, I would just reiterate that uh, before I would be in favor of uh, entertaining Lot 20 splitting to create Lot 21, that all issues that might be outstanding on the use of that lot currently be uh, put to rest. Okay. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. Anything, John? Oh, oh you got them all. No. Susan? Yeah. Back in the day. <clears throat> A lot of my stories start like that. My grandmother lived in that house. Mm -hmm. She did. She lived on the second floor. There was an apartment up there. My grandmother lived up there for quite a long time after she moved out of the house where Rocky Rosbera now lives. Quite a down trip from that house to this apartment, but and it was a lovely piece of farmland back then. It was beautiful. So I'm going to side with Michael on the fact that when this all happened to begin with, it was a sad moment in my life. But you know change happens this is a little this is a step that i don't like to see happen either but i also live on black point road which decided to change just a little bit when the when the sewer went by so i understand what happens when the sewer goes through so having said all of that i want to echo that we really have to get what's happening on lot 20 completely straightened out i'm very i'm going to take a word from michael um it's unfortunate that Lot 21 is going to end up looking for an entrance on out from Black uh, from Broad Turn. Um, I'm going to look at the um, the traffic study very carefully because we drive that a lot. I'm not convinced that what was going on the other side with the um, Dunstan people and so on, the traffic. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Anyway, I don't see that we have an awful lot of choice here. Um, you know, as long as you're in compliance. And everything is in the ordinance. Um, I do think it should be very clearly in whatever is the applicant does. That lot 22 does have to enter on exit onto Saratoga. And I'm curious, you know. I mean, if the choice was between no lot 21 or lot 21 that had to have a 200-foot driveway that exited onto Saratoga Lane, which do you suppose <laughs> would be chosen? 
anyway, that's just my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Roger? Um, I basically agree with all the comments that have been, uh, been made so far. Uh, I, you know, taking into consideration that Lot 21 is going to have to, for all practical reasons, have access onto Broad Turn Road. I don't think it makes, if I was a homeowner, I wouldn't want a home on Lot 21 with a road going out to Saratoga and have to maintain that in the winter myself. Right. That, that's, a, that's a pretty long haul. Yeah. So um, I think it's, I agree with uh, what's been said. It's kind of, I guess, unfortunate the way this has kind of evolved, but it's, um, that's, that's the way it can be right now. So we have to live with it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Nick? I don't have any comments. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, not a whole lot more to be said. Um, I certainly <coughs> echo and amplify the, the desire to make sure that, setting everything else aside, that we need to square away Lot 20 and, and the compliance there. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing more on that. Um, and just, again, echoing, kind of, kind of su summarizing the recurring themes here. Um, not wild about having a new curb cut off broad turn road. Um, kind of goes against what we're trying to do generally, but again, it is what it is. Um, and uh, we'll want to make sure that that lot 22 um, driveway uh, off Saratoga is, is codified and memorialized one way or another. Um, beyond that, I don't think it's worth uh, belaboring anymore, but um, we'll, I think you've gotten the, the message pretty clearly and we'll look forward to seeing the next step all right thank you very much thank you <laughs> item number seven on the agenda m and r holdings llc requests <coughs> sketch plan review for a site plan amendment for six washington avenue assessor's map r62 Lot 24. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the applicant is before the board. They're looking to uh, repurpose uh, an existing building. And as part of that, uh, for their business needs, they're looking to expand the existing uh, parking and paved areas on the site. So they're before the board for a site plan amendment. And this is the sketch plan review uh, component. The property is in the industrial district, and it is encumbered by shoreland zoning overlay. Um, I think one of the things that was noted in staff's comment was uh, at the time of original subdivision approval and for some years thereafter presumably, the shoreland zo uh, zoning overlay area was actually in the resource protection district which would have prohibited this type of development. But since then local ordinances have changes which would permit it, again, provided they meet our local standards. Um, so, but the one issue that we uh, identified in reviewing the applicant's submission was there seems to be a DEP condition of approval in terms of these lots. So we we'll just want to understand how and what it would take to update that, modify those, um, that condition. Um, in terms of that, I think, you know, it's a fairly straightforward uh, um, expansion of the existing areas. <coughs> we'll just, as this moves forward, want to know obviously some more details around stormwater controls and access management and those sorts of things. Um, but with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. And I will turn it over to Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair, <clears throat> St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of MR Holdings, LLC. And as Jay mentioned, we are uh, discussing a existing building that's in the industrial park. It's actually uh, a lot on a lot that was split uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, the subdivision uh, was approved for the industrial park in the early 80s. And um, as part of that plan, there was a building that was built for a company called Penn Main Oil. Over the years, the building uh, was sold, and the last tenant that had still has the signage up on it was Bard Industries. So if you Bard, B A R D. Uh, so if you happen to drive by there, you'll see the signage for Bard Industries. The applicants actually purchased the building in May of this year, and they'd like to do some interior renovations. The building itself is a little over 13,000 square feet in size. It has a warehouse and an office component in it. What they'd like to do is make some adjustments expanding the office needs 
and reducing the uh, square footage <coughs> in the warehouse. So the overall building would not change size-wise, but interior uses would change. As a result, there's 14 parking spaces that are on the site right now. There are docks at the back of the building. There is an overhead at-grade door on the front. There's also an at-grade door at the rear. So with the 14 parking spaces, that's not sufficient to meet their anticipated tenant needs. So what they wanted to do was look at providing for improvements to circulation and parking on the site. So the plan that we have before you shows those proposed improvements. The lighter shade of gray <coughs> is the, exact, is the uh, existing edge of pavement. The darker gray is shows the areas that are proposed to be expanded. So if you see behind the building, we're basically squaring off the pavement in that area. We'd add some striping to provide some um, normal size vehicle parking. And we also have the provisions to maintain the existing uh, docks and the overhead door access to the rear. So the, those would still be part of the, the element. So you'd still have the ability to drive into the building mm -hmm. from both sides. Um, on the front of the building, there is some parking uh, that is provided. There are not many spaces, and they're sort of parallel, if you will, now. Our proposal is actually to uh, go to a one-way circulation on the site. As you can see on the plan, we would provide angled parking along the front of the building. It would put the pavement edge a little bit closer to Washington Avenue, and we would adjust the edge of the planter area by about uh, less than a two feet of a reduction in width by the planter area. The circulation, if you'll also look at, if you look on this plan here, it would be on the left side or the northerly side of the building. We're actually proposing to have a loop around the building. Right now, all the vehicles that come in have to turn around in the back and exit the same way they came in. This uh, configuration allows us to have a loop circulation pattern and, and reinforces that one-way uh, travel pattern through the site. So uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, this is in the industrial district. It is subject to the shoreland overlay as well. Uh, Moses Creek abuts the backside uh, of the uh, parcel. And if you look at the plan, you'll see that blue dashed line. That's 250 feet from the creek. So that's the uh, limit of the shoreland <coughs> zoning overlay that applies to the site. As I mentioned, the original building was built in 1987. <coughs> and at that time, that predated the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act of 88. And so a lot of uh, what happened in that transition period was areas that um, had been set aside for protection of resources was now either identified as shoreland zoning or RP. In this case, Scarborough has identified that whole corridor area as shoreland zoning because there were properties that were developed at that time. So with that, we ended up in a situation, as Jay noted, that we had a DEP permit that referenced a 250 foot uh, buffer, is what they called it, uh, on the plan. and. We are now in the shoreland zone, which is different. The shoreland zoning does allow what we are proposing to do. We're allowed to do up to 20% of impervious area within the shoreland zone. We're at about 14, uh, so we're well within those restrictions. There's a 75-foot setback from the resource, which is applicable in the current zoning. That's that sort of pink line that's on the plan, so we're well outside of that with our improvements uh, for that. So in follow-up to Jay's comment, we were actually fortunate enough to be able to meet with the DEP on Friday to talk to them about this project, to show them uh, the prior plans for the project and the existing permits uh, for this project that were issued by the DEP. The DEP concurs that that was happening all at that same timeline where the transition for mandatory shoreland zoning came into play, and that happens, uh, has happened in other areas as well. So. The permit does have a condition on it that we need to, uh, through a minor revision through the DEP, remove that condition from our permit. And that would allow the consistency between the state and the local level zoning uh, in order for it to proceed. So that's a relatively straightforward process that we would be going through concurrent with our review uh, with you folks. And in that original permit for the business park, there are some criteria for setbacks that we would need to hold from the creek. 
which is a little bit different than the 250. We're well outside of those setbacks, but that would be what we would need to meet uh, in order to maintain compliance with the subdivision for the industrial park for the permits for that. So we were very fortunate to be able to meet with the DEP on Friday uh, and to have that discussion. So. Uh, we're very much uh, excited about moving the project forward and being able to uh, you know, proceed with formal site plan review with you folks. There were a couple of other comments that were included in staff memoranda, and I just wanted to follow up on a couple of them as well. One question was raised with regard to potential floor drains within the building. We're not aware of any, but we will double check to make sure that there are no floor drains that connect into the, the city or the town system. Uh, in addition, the fire department wanted to make sure that our plan provided a 20-foot minimum fire lane around the building. We had ant anticipated to do that, so that is not an issue uh, with that. And um, the last one is with regard to on-site lighting and looking at the existing fixtures on the building to make sure that they are the cutoff variety, and we would do that as well. So next steps in the process would be to uh, prepare a site plan for you folks, incorporating any comments that we receive from you tonight. Uh, we will be also working with uh, the town staff on the drainage uh, to come up with a program for that that's consistent with the provisions for the overall industrial park. So um, that's where we are. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any board questions or comments? Nick? Yeah, I just quickly re clarify that for me. So there's a, there was an issue with the DEP permitting and what you could or could not do. <laughs> if I'm reading this correctly, though, they forced a deed covenant. So are they altering the deed as well? Are they removing their requirement on your deed? That is a process that would, would uh, have to go through with the deed itself. But yes, it has been done uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. Basically, the reason that that particular property has that uh, restriction on it and not all of the properties uh, in the industrial park is because that particular lot was split in 87. And so in the split, that ended up being a condition on that particular lot. So not every lot has uh, that requirement on it. So with the revisions that we would be doing at the DEP, we would um, modify the permit that's for this lot split that created this lot and the one beside it. And that removal of that condition would be on there and then <coughs> there would have to be a correction coordinated through the DEP on that on the deed side right so my I guess my question is would would this board hold that same standard where usually we don't approve something if they don't have a DEP permit in hand we wouldn't we wouldn't approve something if they hadn't fixed the deed that would allow them to do this correct I mean that would if you have a deed restriction on preventing you from any type of development, then what they're asking here is actually to develop something that they can't do according to their deed. So I would assume the same logic would, ap would apply here, that unless they've corrected their deed, this board probably wouldn't take action. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, and this is, a, this is definitely a very complicated area uh, in which, unfortunately, case law is not clear. Case law sort of provides two different tracks in terms of deed restrictions. Typically, the town's purview on a deed restriction is that's a private covenant. We don't deal in that. We deal in local ordinances and state level permitting. You know, we want to be sure state level permitting is in place and that you meet our local ordinances. If there's a deed covenant, typically um, it's sort of looked at as that's a private issue. That's a private matter. We don't enforce uh, deed covenants or deed issues. That's sort of, that's, been typically the town's track and that's one sort of uh, lineage of case law. There's another lineage that says if a deed covenant is very clear and explicit and provides, you know, there's no ambiguity in terms of what it allows or doesn't allow a property to be used for, the board could say you haven't demonstrated right title interest because your deed covenants are so explicit. Um, I think in this case, Staff's recommendation, because I, I have thought about this question coming into the meeting, and, and um, would be that the DEP agrees to amend their permit, mm -hmm. and that if it's allowed by local ordinance, staff would um, recommend the board follow the first 
course of uh, case law, which seems to be the one, um, which would be the one that would say then the deed restriction is really a private matter, because the deed is it really would be an issue that they would have with the DEP. Having the DEP, they're meet, they'd be meeting local standards again, providing they sort of meet all the stormwater and all those other issues. Um, but you know, that's that's just the best direction staff could give you at this point. It's uh, you know, that's that would be my opinion on on how the board might consider the matter. But um, as I said, case law is not clear on this one, and um, so we're real estate attorneys now. All right, what's that? So we're so we're real estate attorneys well, now. Well, you know, that's <laughs> okay. Well, um, here are my two cents on it, which is if, if we're not enforcing um, a restriction in a deed, who is? I mean, where's, you know, somebody's coming to ask for development into an area that's currently restricted. Why aren't we saying, why, why would we be in a position to say, yeah, go ahead and do it? Uh, that would be my take mm -hmm. on the situation. That, that's just me personally. All of this said, if you straighten everything out, I've got no problem with what I'm seeing. So. If I could just, if I could just add, we did have the conversation with the DEP right. about that deed restriction, and um, the project analyst that we were dealing with had <coughs> bumped up against it before, and um, it is something that would, that was placed by the DEP, so the DEP would be a player in the removal of that. So, I think there there is a process and a mechanism that we can clear it up. Um, for that, that was based on the discussions that we had with the DEP. So yes, the lawyers would be involved to to clarify things, but it is something that the DEP indicated was doable. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Roger. <coughs> I don't really have anything. Um, I, I think everything's uh, and that whole issue you just talked about, which <coughs> I <don't> understand. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think we uh, we may have discovered the creek that was running behind the um, cliffs. Antique place. <laughs> it's Moses Creek's bro. Moses Creek, probably, you know. So, uh, but I, I, I really have nothing else on this. Everything's upset. You could be like Lewis and Clark and go out there and try to find it source. <laughs> <laughs> that no-name no. creek, you know. Right. No-name creek. Susan. I'm all set. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. Um, I may have missed this, Nancy, but. Where is M and R Holdings? What's going on in that facility right now? It's um, the building is essentially vacant. Is that true? So what? The building is pretty much vacant right now. There's some trucks parked at the back of the building. Okay, so what's the intent of putting in there? They have a tenant that's going in there that would be an office type use with they have their own uh, fleet of vehicles that they would be out on on the road. So there'd be employee, as I mentioned in the letter, employee vehicles. They would be. Um, company vehicles there's office staff that's at the building uh, throughout the day and they would have periodic meetings where they would have folks come in for an evening meeting so is that where the, the additional parking spaces would come in that's the need for the additional parking is for the staff the vehicles and um, any meetings that they may have okay. um, I just uh, want to uh, echo what my fellow board members said down there as far as making sure that the DEP sort of lights off on this when everything is said and done. Um, and just point out a couple other things that staff has pointed out that uh, landscaping of the parking space, um, dumpster location, the roofing, um, the any sort of the mechanical devices on the roofing, how that's all taken care of. Um, in other words, I don't recall seeing any mechanical devices on the roof. Do you? Okay, maybe maybe I'm off on that, but but uh, uh, just making sure that. Uh, okay, you've answered most of my questions, and the stormwater, of course. Right. Okay, I'm all done. Thanks. Anyone else down here? Mike? <clears throat> Just real quick. Um, it seems to me that uh, now, if, I, if I'm wrong in this assumption, please correct me. But um, in, in, the, in the notes, it talks about uh, parking required 32 spaces, parking provided 50. Correct. Um, but we're not we're not a hundred percent sure that we're going to need 50. We're just showing 50 for 
maybe from the views of the owners, best case scenario? The, the 50 spaces is based on the anticipated tenant needs. It is something that's based on their observations of their operations. So we're pretty confident that all these spaces uh, are needed. I understand your question. You're asking if there's any sort of well, you know, when I look okay. at when I look at the circulation, it seems to me that um, um, it's all going to be pavement from the side of the building to the edge of the roadway, right? The edge of the driveway. From um, the southerly side of the building, there are four parking spaces. There's a striped walkway, and then there's the drive aisle. Okay, so in that area. Um, <coughs> I might be apt to suggest that you just don't demarcate those spaces until such time you might need them. Maybe you won't need them. It's just a matter of striping, is it not? It is. Um, and then there's these two spaces near the exit area. They seem to me to be a candidate, although not as easily as the others we just talked about for striping, but they just seem to be, a, to me, go ahead and build them if you need them, but I don't know if I'd do it right away, and that's all. Unless, unless you're just convinced that this is what you need, you know. That's my only comment. I don't have any real, I'm not opposed to what you're showing me. Mm -hmm. but. We'll certainly take your, your comments into consideration, and if there's an opportunity to reduce, we can, but I'm reasonably confident that that is what they need. Okay. All right. So nothing more to add. Um, what's the, uh, I think you spoke that the current Ingress and egress is limited to one in and out? It's, there's, there's two points of access oh, from, um, if you look at the plan here, you can see the lighter areas. There are two points of access into the site. And if you look at the original 1987 plan, it would appear that the intent was to have a circulation, mm. sort of in a one-way pattern. And um, the parking isn't very well defined out in that area. Um, and there isn't anything at this point that identifies that you can't go in, in either direction uh, through the site, but as part of our plan, we want to promote and foster that circulation pattern, which would be a counterclockwise pattern. Right, and I think that's a big improvement, certainly. So those are my only comments, Nancy, that uh, it just strikes me as those total of six <coughs> spaces that I sp spoke of, mm -hmm. you know, just seem to seems like the, certainly the overall presentation <clears throat> of the plan just appears to work much better without those there. But if they're needed, they're needed. No, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mike. And just picking up on that, um, I, obviously it's an industrial zone, um, but I just want to make sure we are being thoughtful about the parking and, and um, with the development of the site plan that you continue to sort of think that through. And if there's, <coughs> you know, if there's a strong rationale for it, that's fine, and we can build in some flexibility. That's good, too. Um, beyond that, it's all been pretty well covered, um, pretty straightforward overall, provided you can get the <coughs> work through the, the deed restriction question and the, the DP, and glad to hear that you've met with them and that there's an ongoing line of communication there. Correct. Um, so aside <coughs> from that, um, I think we'll just look forward to seeing the site plan and going from there. Is there anything more that you need from us? I think we're good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can we excuse who? Item number eight. 299 Gorham Road LLC requests a sketch plan review for property identified as 299 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map R35, Lot 9D. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see, this is a uh, parcel that is both in the uh, Running Hill Gorham Road <coughs> mixed use district and the Running Hill Gorham Road transitional district. Um, get based on the size of the site, this project will need to go through our plan development review process. Um, at this stage, the applicant is before the board for a sketch plan, really as a, an opportunity to bring the board up to speed with the property. Um, just by way of background uh, for board members, some board members may recall 
it must be going on six or eight years ago or so that the town working with um, uh, the property owner really was taking a strong look at the Running Hill Road uh, corridor and taking a look at potential connections through this property. Um, that project, you know, or, or, or process by and large has um, sat on the shelf, but it does at least bear um, mentioning in that there has been consideration in terms of the uh, through connection from <coughs> Gorham Road crossing this parcel up to Running Hill. Another component that the town and the property owner have been um, partnering on or in discussions about have been about sewer connections um, and, and getting sewer uh, across the highway to the site. And those are ongoing discussions that we <coughs> anticipate working through as this uh, project development goes through the process. Um, just for the benefit of the board and the public at large, um, plan development review process is really designed as a very deliberate and, and measured uh, process. It has three steps. It begins with a site inventory and analysis, which culminates in a master plan process, which ultimately leads us to uh, the form, sort of more formal detailed site plan review process. Um, this site, uh, given, it, given the uh, size of the site and the proposed development scenarios, uh, would have triggered uh, site law uh, permitting through the DEP, but as board members will note, within the last year or so, the town received municipal capacity to go through that review process and really be the DEP's eyes on that permitting process. And as part of that, one of the requirements that we had to modify our ordinances was to require that the Maine Historic Preservation and the IFNW and the Fish and Wildlife have an opportunity to weigh in on these projects prior to the board beginning their formal review. With all that said, when the applicant submitted their uh, site inventory analysis, sort of identified that that review process hadn't had a chance to occur, but in talking with the applicant, they still want to get before the board, again, just to bring the board up to speed basic knowledge of where the parcel is, what we're looking at, and to begin the discussion. Um, so uh, this is a sketch plan and, and really no formal uh, uh, action is uh, expected or, or um, by the board this evening. Um, all that said, staff provided board and the applicant with some comments with regards to overall site design and really at the very preliminary stage because we're, um, we're, we're very early in the process. Um, we also just did note some of the other items that seem to be missing from the site inventory checklist um, for the applicant to be aware of, and this might be an opportunity if there are any of those items that the applicant thinks they might be seeking a waiver for, it's a good opportunity to at least engage that conversation, see if the board's even willing to entertain it moving forward, provide they provide a, a written rationale for the waiver request um, for formal action at a future uh, meeting. Um, or if the board's just not even going to go down that path. Um, so uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think I've set the context and will certainly be happy to answer questions as we go along. But I will turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> and I'll turn over to the applicant's representative. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Harding. I work for Sebago Technics. I uh, have with me tonight Ken Grondon, who's uh, from Grondon Corporation, representing the applicant, which is 299 Gorham LLC at this time. <coughs> um, the site uh, is an 89 acre site. Uh, it's represented here in mostly the green and the brown areas. Uh, down to the southerly part is uh, Gorham Road and it's uh, Route 114. There's also frontage along uh, New Road off on to the uh, northwest. And uh, also, as, a, as Jay mentioned, there has been conversations in the past about extending the property uh, the, excuse me, the roadway all the way to the Running Hill Road, uh, which is up here, and that would require some cooperation with the abutter as well. And there's been past conversations about that. <coughs> um, the uh, golf course, the Nunsuch golf course, is down here to the um, south. Again, trying to orient the uh, the board. We envision that our our roadway would uh, align with the driveway, the drive to the golf course so that we'd have a four-way intersection there. Um, as Jay alluded, there's been some, a lot of past conversations about the property. Uh, this actually had been um, studied quite heavily uh, back in the pre-recession days, and one of the things that we've had to do is work with Ken to dust off some of those old studies and 
uh, look at some of the things and see what uh, we can reuse and what we need to update and uh, we can talk about that further as we go along uh, one of the things that has been done is the wetlands have been delineated out there it's been done a little while ago by Jim Boyle and I talked to Jim today and Ken's had conversations with him as well uh, we're gonna have Jim go out and uh, walk around the site and update the uh, the wetlands report that was done before the recession there was some discussion about vernal pools in that report uh, in talking to Jim today and Ken uh, we believe that there is a significant vernal pool and I'm going to just going to point to the green area over here because we're not exactly sure where it is but that's one that would be um, um, looked at by the main DEP there's also a couple other vernal pools that the Army Corps would have jurisdiction over so we'll need to identify those and work within those parameters as we go forward um, the main inland fish and wildlife uh, has uh, been requested to provide an opinion on that um, we did go to the federal register and, and look and the northern long ear bat was listed there and I know the state has added two more species to the list so we expect that we'll be uh, dealing with that issue going forward uh, as many projects will uh, the other group that we've uh, sent a package to is the Maine Historical Preservation Conservation Group there's actually been quite a few studies done in the past and I, I believe we're in in good shape um, there's been some prehistoric studies done uh, Ken's provided me with copies of those and uh, we also provided the uh, uh, Maine Historic Preservation Group with updated photos of uh, some of the structures that are nearby that uh, are over 50 years old in the previous studies they, they have not identified any that were on the historic register so we believe we're going to be okay there but obviously we need to get an updated uh, opinion from those folks uh, one of the main uh, issues that we'll be dealing with as we go forward is uh, the Red Brook corridor and Red Brook is uh, the blue line here that bisects the property uh, Red Brook is an urban impaired stream so we'll need to uh, be very careful as when we cross the uh, Red Brook that we uh, provide a, a crossing that has minimal environmental damage uh, but also um, provides effective uh, access to the remainder of the site uh, the town is looking at this new road culvert here on Red Brook uh, potentially uh, lowering that to provide a, a better flow through that currently there's an impoundment up above here so we'll need to take that into account as we size our culvert moving forward um, primarily the topography is rolling from the north down to Red Brook and then it comes back up uh, back onto 114 so Red Brook uh, represents pretty much the entire watershed of the of the site uh, as you can see there's the green arrows are uh, green areas are predominantly uh, areas where we're going to try to be uh, very sensitive to uh, there are uh, several wetland pockets in through those areas uh, the uh, applicants desires to pr provide a very ecologically sensitive development uh, we're going to focus on development in these brown areas which we're referring to as pods there's there's right now four pods as the project goes forward we envision developing that in four or five phases as uh, we can uh, move forward through the the development process um, zoning is uh, RH and RH2 um, so it's uh, very much uh, in encompassing the primarily we're looking at residential development now um, and we envision that perhaps up to 250 units could be provided through multi-planning uh, multi housing or single-family housing uh, the uppermost development pod uh, next to Running Hill Road is the one that we're most um, conceptual at this time there's a p potential for it to be a commercial type development depending on what happens uh, next next to the property and you know what what goes on perhaps three four or five years in the future uh, utilities there's a water main uh, in route 114 we extend we envision extending that if the roadway goes all the way to running hill road we would envision that the water district would like to connect to the water main and running hill road um, but that's something we'll need to work out with the uh, water district jay mentioned the uh, the sewer extension that would be uh, that the applicant is talking with the town about um, we envision a pump station either on our site connecting to that sewer or 
potentially maybe the town would like to put the, the pump station on the property itself, which I think Ken would be open to as we move forward. Um, there were a few comments made on uh, Jay's memo and one had to do with site distance. We think there's ample site distance. We may require some clearing as we go to the le uh, to the west. <coughs> we'll obviously measure that and provide you folks with a update on that. Uh, we talked about the wetlands and the vernal pools. Uh, there was a, a comment about floodplain, which I believe would be right along the, the uh, Red Brook corridor. We can obviously map that as well for you folks. Um, and then moving forward it would be our desire <coughs> to focus primarily on, on what we're calling the first phase which would be between red brook and group 114 and really develop those plans um, very specifically while still providing conceptual plans for the remaining pod areas we understand the importance of making sure that the development's consistent moving forward uh, we want to make sure that uh, the roadways appropriately lo located there's been a lot of discussion about that a lot of past study that's been done uh, with that issue and we feel like we've uh, got a very good idea of where that should go so we can minimize the environmental damage while still providing an adequate <coughs> access to the remainder of the parcel um, again as I mentioned the wetland evaluation we're gonna have Jim Boyle go out and do an update on that that study and we hope that would be sufficient for you folks and we'll get updates as well from the inland fish and wildlife folks and the historical group and the only other item that uh, I believe was on there was a market study um, we'd like to have some direction for the board that's something that we'd like to consider waiving uh, Ken has been working very closely with Jerry Appleby of Appleby commercial uh, we feel very strongly that uh, the residential use and the, the part adjacent to 114 is the most appropriate use for that area uh, again as we go further north and into the future there may be opportunities to do commercial development but at this time that would be purely speculative and uh, would let, rather wait till a more appropriate time in the future to study that that particular pod um, with that I turn it back over to you <coughs> thank you Anybody interested in starting off down here you want to kick off Mike okay these things are hard sometimes to <coughs> get my arms around, you know, but um, how many acres is the um, the pod that you uh, are more, more interested in uh, developing it? For, yeah, know? it's about, uh, it looks like a little bit less than five acres. <coughs> and so the density, what would the density be there? What's the level? <coughs> is that in the RH uh, zone exclusively or RH2? Um, I believe that is in the RH2 zone. I'm going to look to Jay to help me out, I'm hoping. So the density wouldn't all be that. Well, what's the uh, density of that, Jay? Do you mind? I, I don't have it in front of me. I'm right. sorry. What was that? I'm not prepared. What What's the uh, density for RH2? Density in RH2. Hmm? Now, typically in these kinds of concepts, <clears throat> more often than not, the limited the, the, the limited few that I've seen, the residential is inlet is 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 further in and the commercial aspects are more out by the major artil arteries you know the, mm -hmm. like in this case 114 but you're speaking of actually looking into the opposite a little differently yeah um, it you know along 114 right now is primarily residential areas we've got the golf course on the other side of the um, <coughs> roadway from us we just feel that this quarter makes more sense to this parcel or portion of the parcel makes more sense to do a, a residential type development now looking at multi-housing um, in the future where that upper area is although it's furthest away from route 114 it may be very close to running hill road there may be other developments there that it can marry into more suitably than this particular piece so that's that's kind of the rationale right now okay and I know it's very early what was that Jay uh, so yeah I was just gonna say the in both zones both the RH and the RH2 the base density is five units per net residential acreage okay. and then there are additional uh, density bonuses that could be built in um, 
So it could build higher than that, but the base is five. And you're looking at more of like a, um, like a multi-housing type, not a single family layout? No, we're looking at more multi-housing uh, duplexes or potentially quadplexes. Okay. Well, it's not a whole lot to comment on at this point in time, I don't think. I uh, look forward to seeing it come back. Um, I, I do see that, you know, the connection to Running Hill, it would make more sense to have the commercial out by there. That's right down the street from the Target, a complex and everything else. But um, do you have any ideas on how to cross Red Brook? Yeah, actually, we've looked at it quite a bit. Um, we would have to do some sort of either an open bottom arch type culvert. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard that those are which. preferred over the yeah conference. that's that's really the preferred way to do it um it gets depending on how big the crossing is sometimes those get um so they're not financially feasible and we may have to go to a, a concrete box type culvert but if we know, do uh, that it we'd seems have like to if this merge the if this property is developed to its potential it seems like the uh an arch type of crossing would be certainly within the yeah we just yeah. need to make sure it's it's right. practical and feasible right um because you but can't, re it would be hard to redo it. That's all. No, we don't want to redo it. No, no. But I appreciate your uh, your comments and bringing it forward. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just uh, there was another question that came up about the zoning. So just to be clear, and it, you can sort of see it up there. And I'll apologize that it's not maybe. Well, now you can't see anything, so I apologize for that. But uh, running the RH2 really encompasses. Essentially, half of the land uh, towards um, uh, Gorham Road, the Running Hill RH district, the other half headed back up towards the Running Hill Road proper. All right, thank so. you. I think that's it's worth keeping that in mind. Obviously, sure. we are at a very preliminary stage, but it's worth keeping that in mind to the extent there's any thought of commercial use at that that uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. so. Ron? Well, sir. Yeah, um, I'm curious of the five acres that my colleague just talked about, why the multi as opposed to single family at this stage in the game? Um, I'm going to speak first and Ken, if I misspeak, please, or if you want to add to it, please step up here. I think we're looking to try to maximize the density in that area and do something that's commercially viable, but take advantage of some of the residential uh, bonuses that are that are available to us and get more of the units there uh, we have 900 or so feet of frontage along there but we obviously don't want to carve it up and have individual driveways coming out onto 114 okay. 114 and it seemed to make a, a better approach we've we've got about 250 feet of depth there so we don't have a whole lot to play with but uh, we think we can get some drives in there and and use that uh, the prox um, a more uh, tightly residential area to 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 make that development work yeah, like my colleagues this is in its infancy phases but so other than that I'll be curious to see how this progresses as we go along thank you Mr. thanks Chair. Ron Nick yeah um, <laughs> I uh, I have to drive on 114 every day and I am less than thrilled to hear that there could be 250 other cars joining me on that <laughs> commute. Um, so as my colleagues so cordially said, I will be very interested to see how this progresses going forward. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, I actually think this is kind of exciting. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> um, I, I recall a few years ago when, when this whole area was developed, this was, if I'm not mistaken, this supposed to be sort of a transition from the mall out towards here. And um, how, it, it seems to me it's going to be very important to have that connection to Running Hill Road. Mm -hmm. um, is that correct? I mean, yeah, can, it would this, be, can this work without that connection if, if you're not successful with that? We would have to rethink some things. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, I think it works better for for everybody if we have that connection. I mean, what's the likelihood? Helps address. Of, yeah, what's the likelihood? I think Ken has had some uh, conversations with the, the landowners from a long time ago. Yeah. And there have been some discussions back and forth, so I think it's you know, reasonably um, confident going forward that that can be done. Um, the other question is um, on the sewers. 
Um, if I recall, they were talking <coughs> about coming in actually from the Westbrook side at one point, weren't they? Um, I recall that being discussed at one point. Um, the, the more recent discussions have been about coming across the turnpike, okay. and the town is currently engaged with uh, uh, professional services, engineering services, to begin preliminary design work to explore the, the best alternative. Uh, oh, okay. So that, that's, that's underway. So, so that's a real viable, uh, uh, likely option if that's going to occur then. We're, we're exploring it, but yes. Versus it, going in the other way. Yes, versus going towards Westbrook, correct. Yeah, okay. Um, All right. Yes, that All seems right. like. Good. Okay. Um, I, um, other than those are the only two um, comments I had or questions. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Susan? I'm very confused. Okay. So, potentially, assuming that we get a connection from Running Hill Road all the way down to 114, then whatever comes down is going to enter, is going to come right through this small piece that you're looking to develop first. Yes? Correct. It's only how many acres? This area, this area, the shaded area yep. in brown is about five acres. Right. Five acres in which we're going to have multiplexes, duplexes, mm -hmm. maybe a quad. And we're going to, I'm, I'm assuming that this is going to work, you see. I think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have a bunch of people who are not going to want to go out to 114 to come back, right? And what are they going to do? They're going to come right down from Running Hill Road, 114, through your multiplexes and duplexes and quads. So if you decide that's what you're going to do when you come back with some kind of a specific, I think you're going to have a real moving traffic issue in and out and around whatever it is you ultimately decide to put in there. Because it's not very big, you want to maximize the number of units, and I understand that completely. But how you can do that and also make it, I don't want to call it a major arterial, but it's going to be a busy road. And I'm not asking you to solve it. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that this is one of those things that I would like to make sure that you know. To me, that's a honk and flag. Yeah, and, and we, I think, <coughs> tried to allude to that in in the uh, package that we sent you that we know we're going to have to address traffic. But see, this is one of the reasons why, to take you back to staff comments, where I, we really are looking for you to give to us before when you come back next. A site inventory and analysis phase, I think that we're at. A conceptual site plan and preliminary infrastructure plan for the master plan phases are submitted, which cover the entire parcel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to have some idea of where you think the commercial is going to go and how, er, how the traffic is going to move and how the water is going to be carried. Mm -hmm. And that's all got to be at least sketched out for us. Yep because this is an overall plan. And I'm only saying that again, which I know you know, because you've also said, however, that it will probably develop as the economics dictate. That's normal. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to, but we need to have some concept of what, how I want to say this. Economics alone cannot drive this. You know, this is a big piece of property that we, have, uh, that we want to see looked at holistically mm -hmm. and so when you come back in I for one and I think the rest of, the, of my board members here are going to want to see something that gives us a sense that you've really got an overview from top to bottom with wiggle room changes can happen mm -hmm. and you'll have to come back here to make all those changes okay so I'm just putting in a plug here for the fact that if you this this is why the market study was suggested so that you could make sure that you could come up with the necessary information to come up with the proper land use for what is going to be the market. I'm not looking for any problems with this one little piece. I'm looking for the overall impact. I'm sorry. I've been coughing too much, and I moved it for that. I'll take it back. Thank you. Um, I'm just putting in a plug for the fact that we really need to know as much as we possibly can know about the appropriate land uses as foreseen for the entire pro property, which is why we have this three-step process. I'm, I'm okay with the first step, but I'm definitely not going to have any kind of a concept of how it's going to look until we get to phase number two. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Project? Yeah, just to follow up on what Sue was saying. Uh, this is primarily to Jay, I guess. On a plan <coughs> development, the overall master <coughs> plan, if they come back with a, uh, or any developer comes in with a, uh, a master plan, but they only want to develop one phase of it. Mm -hmm, we do it. And it's going to be over a number of years. They can come back and make changes to it, to the master plan, as change, as, as the uh, economy changes and things like that, can't they? Correct. The, the ordinance provides a, an option that the applicant can work with the board on in terms of taking a large development such as this in phases, but it does require that at the outset it begins with a site inventory for the entire parcel, and that's the first step in the board's review process, that you look at the entire parcel in terms of site inventory. Then, as part of the master plan process, which is step two, um, it also requires that there be a conceptual, I'm sorry, um, yeah, preliminary infrastructure, uh, the, con the conceptual site plan and preliminary infrastructure plan of the master plan phase must be submitted um, for the entire parcel as well. But the other components of the master plan can be then parred down to the smaller parcel. So, so the ordinance dictates which components of this multi-step process and within each of the three steps maybe I'll call them phases because that's what the ordinance calls them within each of the three review phases there's multiple steps so this ordinance spells out which of the steps in each phase need to be taken sequentially um, before you can get to that point of then saying okay now let's just look at this one five acre parcel or whatever that size is determined to be um, so that's laid so, out in the ordinance. So <coughs> on, their, on their master plan, they could they could actually show us some commercial component, you know, yeah. like way in the northern section there. But it could change. Five years change. from now, they may decide that that's not going to work. <coughs> sure. Like all plans, they yeah. can be sure. amended. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Sure. That brings up a point. I sat on a committee and. It'll go nameless, the, the parcel, but there's a major parcel in which there were some inquiries about developing. And one of the things that we stressed as a committee is to have a master plan so that it wasn't mismash in the final analysis, that it could be done in piecemeal, <coughs> so to speak, but that there was a master plan so that it all sort of fit together rather than looking like uh, haphazard here, there, and everywhere else. So I think the points that are being made down there are well taken as far as the master plan is concerned, even though it may be susceptible to changes as, as time goes along. I just want to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you. I got a quick question, too. Sure. As far as when somebody can take advantage of the residential bon no, when the, the density bonuses, if it's a master plan and you've got... <coughs> Is it broken down into a percentage of when they can start to take some of that density bonus for the additional housing units? Do you know? I mean, if what, I, what I'm hearing is, is it sounds like they want to take advantage of some of the density bonuses up front in phase one. Mm -hmm. So phase five ends up being 15 years from now. I mean, is there, is there any allotment of when they can take advantage of those bonuses? Sure, I think through the overall development process, well, the applicant will need to do a net residential calculation for mm -hmm. the entire parcel, um, and that will spell out what the entire net res for, for this site is, and let's just say it's 100 units, mm -hmm. you know, just picking a number. Um, if they want to apply 20 of those to the first phase, we'll know we have 80 left for what's remaining out there. Um, so that's sort of how that works. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of good projects to sort of that are similar to this that are developing in phases would be Dunstan Crossing uh, and Eastern Village. Those are both 100 plus uh, developments. Um, one's even, I think, over 200. Right. And they're happening over many, many years. Uh, so certainly that's possible. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so this, I think this has been a useful discussion, and I think pretty much what we were hoping for at this stage to give everyone some background and a general idea of what the applicant has in mind and um, you know, give ourselves <coughs> a better understanding of this <coughs> going forward. Um, there's clearly a lot of homework yet to do um, for the applicant talked about 
getting the wetlands delineation updated, the IFNW review, uh, the historic review. Um, and I'm going to recommend that while that's going on, we also use that time to have our conservation committee, uh, conservation commission, um, take a look at it as well. Um, you noted some of the some of the habitats and potential vernal pools, and um, this is something that we've started doing within the last few years is sort of tasking the conservation commission to look at specific projects when it seems appropriate, and this seems like a good candidate for that as we're heading into this you know, more formal inventory phase of things. Um, obviously, whether there's a connection through to Running Hill Road is going to be a, a big X factor, as the applicant noted. Um, I also just want to reiterate again that um, just as, you know, by way of some general feedback to the applicant that um, that section of Running Hill Road, particularly heading out, um, as I've been involved in some more long-range planning type conversations, there's a lot of sensitivity around trying to preserve as much of the rural character of that road as possible. Um, and it is an RH zone. And so to the extent that there is some thought of commercial development, um, I just wanted to, again, kind of flag that as a, as a consideration going forward, uh, keeping in mind that, again, we're at a preliminary stage here. So um, beyond that, I think you're pretty clear on, on what the next steps are, and uh, unless you have any questions for us. Yeah, I had a couple of questions, sure. if I could. Um, you mentioned the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Do you folks reach out to them, or is that something we should do, or...? We'll generally have the staff facilitate it. Jay can, Jay can okay. be a conduit for that. Certainly can meet with them if, if necessary. Sure. Um, and, and again, we certainly understand your comments about making sure that we do everything that is consistent and take into effect, um, you know, the density that the other parts of the development would have. Um, in previous conversations with Ken, we've, we're, we're looking at some preliminary road sections you know we're looking at a, a fairly decent sized road with an esplanade fairly wide walkway to accommodate it um, pedestrians through the development we're really looking towards coming up with some trail systems some recreational opportunities doing something more uh, ecologically sound in you know the areas particularly uh, new road and some of the areas on the eastern side of the si side of the site setting those aside and conserving those um, so we're certainly looking at those things and certainly recognize the need to make sure the infrastructure, the utility systems are all sized appropriately. Uh, I guess I go back to the question of a marketing study. Is that something that everybody's hard and fast on or is there any wiggle room there? Susan, you're shaking your head. Well, my, my answer to that is that when I, when I heard the suggestion, I thought it was a suggestion. In other mm -hmm. words, the idea is that that staff and the board feels as if this needs to be a mixed use and if we're not sure it's going to be sellable as a mixed use you know getting some um, survey market survey would not be a bad idea but as long as you're clear that we don't want this to end up being all residential quite clearly we don't want this am I right I mean this is a, this is a multiple multi-use Mm -hmm. I don't know that, that I don't know that there's a general consensus around that. I, I would okay. say I'm that glad I, it up I would say that it's you know while we're you know we don't like to kind of uh, arbitrarily impose third-party costs on on owners and applicants. But in my personal opinion, I think given the scale of this and the location of it and the number of variables that are out there um, to get to what Susan was saying, um, I think that the more information we can have the better um, and again I don't well, I, think if I don't I, may, I don't take that lightly uh, but I, I do think that um, given the combination of factors here that, that that would be helpful others can chime in but well, let, let me be a little see if I can clarify my thoughts because I'm not sure I'm clear on them actually um, I'm responding to something that was offered as a staff comment where it says um, that this particular narrative suggests that development is to consist of a variety of housing types with only the, quote, possibility of community commercial <coughs> uses. 
okay? And then the suggestion was that a market study as sought has, as part of the site inventory phase may provide necessary information to help determine if the appropriate mix of land uses are being considered to meet the plan development criteria. That's what I'm looking at. In other words, we ask that it have as much of a um, mix of land uses as possible. Yeah. And I will leave it at that for, for clarification from staff if I'm doing something incorrect. Is what I'm saying accurate? <clears throat> You read my memo, um, I, so I mean, I, essentially, I where, so therefore, any question has to go to him. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just, I, I guess, I just, you know, I didn't mean to be so flip about that response, but um, in the the ordinance, the plan development ordinance, the site inventory uh, does one of the submittal requirements is a market study. Then, when I look at the when I look in the RH and RH2 zoning districts specifically, and you look at the plan development purpose, it talks specifically about having a mix of uses. And so, staff really framed it as a question to the board: Is do you yet know what an appropriate mix of uses are? And if you do, I think you know you can move forward as is. Otherwise, I think that's you know. I'll leave it at that at this point. When you say you, are you talking about the applicant no, or us? us? Us. You're the ones who approve. <laughs> are, is well, the board satisfied that, that the standard in the RH and RH2 district, um, which talks about a mix of land uses, has been satisfied? And, and that was that's my for question. The board to I'd like to see Mark. Well, study. and that's why I asked the I question. I would too. I, I think, again, part of where I'm coming from is that it's not something that we're imposing on the applicant it's a it's a default requirement as part of this process so by waiving it we would be saying that we don't we think that this situation doesn't merit it and I think it does I guess I guess I'm gonna push that merit what that we know what the master plan is so that we have some that we that we know that there's been some more due diligence and that, there's, that we have some more data to support what the plan might be. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with that, okay. And that could certainly come back as the best use for this is totally residential. I mean, right. and we're not, and to be clear, we're not here to, we're not here to determine what this project ultimately is or to design it for the applicant, but it's a, it's a, it's a built-in part of the process, and I think it's appropriate to uh, to require it. I'd also like to point out too that that study might actually show more commercial need in that vicinity. Yeah, I'm, correct? I'm comfortable. Which yeah, I'm might comfortable. also alter yeah, okay. the, the streets, the layouts, the you know, there's a lot that it could impact depending on what it comes back it. with. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we have two examples in this town already. We have uh, Dustin Crossing, which has the mix of housing, residential, plus commercial. And then we have Easton Village, which, as far as I know, is all residential. Right. But it's a mixture of different types, types. of residential. So we, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what I think this is what they're calling for here, mm -hmm. or what they're thinking about. Um, I did have another question, though, on, on the, um, and I don't know whether this makes sense or not, but on the uh, the abutting property um has there been any discussions or is there anything going on where there might be some connectability with roads going to those <coughs> other properties because where you have um development the brown areas there the, the other two <laughs> yeah. you know that those yes, properties north of that look like that would be almost Jared, all developable yeah, I, I'm not that familiar with them, but my limited familiarity is they're privately owned, yeah. very large properties, but residential. I could see and in the future those those being developed and with some roads going in there and the possibility of some connections there. This is something we can look at. It, it, to me, it doesn't jump out at yeah, you. Okay. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the right. easiest would be to connect to, yeah. to New Road and sure it would. that would be uh, difficult. There's there's numerous wet. wetlands there, but it's not impossible. Um, but it's not something that we would see a huge benefit to doing. Um, so Susan, one more question about the map. 
The piece that it goes from um, Bunning Hill Road down to the first yellow dot? Correct. Has no green or brown on it? Yeah, that's, that's an abutted, budding parcel right now. It's an abutting parcel right now. What yeah, does that, that mean? That means it's owned. This piece right here is owned by somebody else. So you got what, a right away through it? We've got a right away discussion that we've had. So we need that's to something they're pull that together. Pursuing. Yeah. That's why. That's one reason why it's such a big, big X factor. Yeah. I mean, if so, this. I mean, I, I hope that I'm. This is not my. These meetings for me should be at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> We're way past my sleepy hour. <laughs> 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 but anyway, it's afternoon but, nap, Susan. <laughs> I tried that, and it just gives me a headache. Um, I love it. I want to go because I really still don't quite get it. If we don't know whether we have a right of way, how can we do a market study? If we don't have, if we don't know we have a right of way, how do we know what kind of development we can have? And we don't have any way that road's too long. I mean, you can't develop it without it. So. We can't do well, anything I, I think else there, right now. There are a lot of variables out there that, that they need to, that they need to I work think, on. I'd like to go on record as saying yeah. that one right there yeah. is what's got to be resolved first. And then whatever else comes out, is, out of it is fine. But I kept looking at it and saying, wow, all of that, and it's not colored. Well, now I know mm -hmm. why. How close are we? There's been conversations in the past. I know Ken is talking to people about that. There was commitment in the past. It's not in okay. writing yet. It's not well, legally you. binding yet, but hopefully we can work that through. Okay. I'm set. Come on up. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Ken Grondon. Um, we've, my, me and my former company have owned that property since 2005 when we acquired it. <coughs> and when we, when we acquired the property, I was confronted by the town to 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 wait on my then proposed use because they were doing a master study at the time and they wanted to come up with the best use for the area and I I respectfully stepped back and said yeah let's let's do what we can and it was really a a, a good experience in a lot of ways because because the town the new town planner back then uh he he said well you can develop your way into it and what sells we can you know we can change the zoning to what's best for the town what's best for you and and see that diversity the property was big enough that you could have a little commercial <coughs> a little residential and you know some older at the at the time there was a nursing home that was interested in the property but what was what was nice about the property was it was so big you could have different pods and and allow that to have that diversity or whatever we still have that um, and what, what I'm thinking is I can phase my way in from running Hill Road uh, I have a background in construction and the sewer feasibility I believe is best for down 114 so it would make sense to feed to phase in from 114 um, from from 114 and and I'm I was pretty anxious to start this prop, prop project for years. Uh, there's so much potential to, to have a really nice looking project. The, the numbers on this for the town are really good for as far as development and revenue and taxes. The total build out of the project will be 50 to 60 million dollars. And I think if it's done right and you don't, I don't want to sound like a disc discriminator or something, but if if you don't allow a lot of lower value homes that lend themselves well to bigger families with lots of children, I think we can have a nice, I don't want to say 55 and over because you never want to box yourself in a corner and say that because what if, what if 55s don't sell? I could have this part, for instance, be 55, put that in the master plan and go with that. Um, I think that one other project I did with the town before that was really interesting to do was Larrabee Wetlands Project. Why I bring that up is because it was a contract zone with the town and we met, it was basically a development, you guys know more about contract zones than I do, but every year you meet and talk about are you meeting the goals that you want and the town 
asked, so we, you know, you, you, and you tweak the process to meet each other's goals, and and um, it's a kind of a partnership in a project like this. This thing we're talking about now is the mixed zone. Um, I can't even remember the terminology. Is something that sounds like you could almost do a hybrid between a contract zone and that, and al allow to make changes as it goes. That, for instance, if a nursing home comes along or something, and I've already said, well, that area is going to be a 55 and over. You know, I don't want to box myself in, in corners, and nor would you, you representing the town, want to see the project not reach its uh, maximum potential, if you will. So there's going to need to be some kind of, I think, give and take in the process if we all want to see what's best for that parcel. Um, my goal is to have a really nice looking project. I could just talk, talk about it a little bit. Uh, the, the culvert crossing that faces 114 was going, I've got it orientated such in my concept that there'll be a vertical stone facing on it, so it'll look like a stone arch. There'll be walking paths with light, lighting, and a lot of money spent on landscaping <coughs> plantings to, to really make it look nice, too. Um, I guess, in closing, the, the big thing is I look forward to working with you all on it. And, and if we could all be open-minded on the uses, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm open-minded as they come. <coughs> I, I, I trust that the land is large enough that we can have different pods of different uses as we go. And go ahead if you have any questions for me. <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, as has been noted, you know, we've had other examples in town where we've where we've had large-scale projects where we've had a master planning type process and there have been opportunities and, and <coughs> for making revisions down the road and there's, you know, a process is built in for that and I think we all have open minds and we're, we realize that circumstances change. So I think this process is set up to be nimble enough to handle that. Um, while also giving us a good grounding at the outset that they're you know that they're that that the uh the land and the infrastructure is there and that there's a that there's a plan understanding that plans sometimes get revised so again we'll look forward to seeing the seeing this as it all gets flushed out and the due diligence goes forward and and everything kind of comes into clearer focus and we'll look forward to seeing the next step okay well thank you Thank you. Can I can I just add a closing comment? If, if I <coughs> if I was developing this project project, what I would present to the board is my vision. Just your vision doesn't mean we're going to hold you to it. Things might change two, three, four years from now, and that part might have to be something else. But that's fine. But the way I would do it is I would just show the board your vision for a build out of that property, okay. and then approach it from one phase to another. Yeah. Will do. Yeah. Thank you. That's well put. Thanks. Do you have anything else? I guess I'm all set. Okay. You folks are. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a town planner's report. Um, yep, just a reminder to board members and, and the public at large that tomorrow night, um, We'll have a um, second consideration of the preliminary design for the Gorham Road corridor. That meeting will be here in Town Hall. And I'm going to ask Angela, what time does that meeting start tomorrow night? The, the Gorham Road? Sorry, 6.30. It's beginning at 6.30 here in Town Hall. So that is what we have to report tonight. Thank you. As long as we're asking scheduling questions, it's going out of order a little yes. bit. Um, for the benefit of board members and the public, when is the next planning board meeting in uh, The first planning board meeting in 2016 is January 11th. All right. Great. 
Karen? It's going to be the not. We have that confirmed. Uh, administrative <laughs> amendment report. Yeah, I have two items to report. Um, let's see, at 5 Gibson Road, which is in the industrial district off of um, uh, Pleasant Hill Road, uh, they received administrative approval for a new overhead door. And Famous Dave's um, received uh, administrative approval for a small addition for a cogeneration um, uh, equipment um, for, for their site. Okay. That Thank is all I have. Thank you. Is there any planning board correspondence? All right. Any planning board comments? <coughs> sure. I'd like to right. thank John DuPont for serving the town so well and uh, for sitting next to me in this last <laughs> several months and supporting me the <coughs> gain from your wisdom. Appreciate your <coughs> Thank you, John. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ron? Yeah, uh, I, I want to thank him too, but in addition <laughs> to that, <laughs> usually. <laughs> <laughs> At this stage, don't we also put in nominations for next year, and then the first meeting that we have in January, we vote on it. Interestingly, we did. We had that conversation last year at this time, Correct. and our resident uh, parliamentary <laughs> expert um, recommended, and I think it made sense, and folks seemed to agree at the time, that it made more sense to do it in January when the, when the uh, nomination, the actual, the actual nomination. Right. Of, when any generally? new members okay. are seated, right. and, okay. and okay, right. I couldn't. Oh. I knew we voted as Nick had recommended, right. but I didn't know if the nominations went in, and then we voted. Okay, right. thank you. If, you. if you want me to expound upon it, typically, actually, you have a <laughs> nominating <laughs> committee, which will then put forth names. <coughs> at the time. Me, the the reason there was a delay was that we did have new members coming in, and I thought they should have been part of that conversation <laughs> as far as putting forward names. And I, and I think that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes I didn't mean to make light of it. You I just think it makes sense. That guy, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to be that makes guy. Makes sense. <laughs> and, oh, one other thing. We have another transportation meeting in December 15th. And I'll report back on some issues after that. Thank you. Now thank John. Thank <laughs> John. <laughs> All right, Susan. Thank you, John. Sincerely. And um, I also just wanted to, excuse me, say that this has been a very challenging meeting in some respects, and I think we did, um, we learned, I learned a lot. I think it went well. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I want to wish uh, John good luck down in Florida. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to mention that um, the United Way is going to be having a a conversation on Wednesday evening at the library uh, and the public is invited uh, and basically they're looking for um, people's opinion regarding how they uh, I guess distribute their their funds and everything in the greater Portland area and they want to make sure Scarborough has a voice in that decision so uh, anybody's nice. welcome to go to attend it uh, that's all I have okay. thanks Roger I'd like to just say thank you to John, and don't be a stranger, not too often. Come back in the summers, play a little golf with us, you know, that type of stuff. <laughs> I also want to thank John. It's a pleasure serving with you, and thanks for your service, not only here, but on a prior town order committee. <laughs> um, and enjoy retirement. Thank you. Uh, aside from that, happy holidays to everyone. Look forward to seeing most of you next year. I'll go as far to be not politically correct and say Merry Christmas yeah. to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Merry thank Christmas. You. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy, yeah, it's happy it's everything. Better, it's been a pleasure. And thank right. you, everybody, for your kindness. Thank you. And I will move to adjourn. Second. So, second. All in favor? Thank you.